Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Mocock flavoured podcast. On this show, I'm casting my mind back to the late 70s when, in Pop's Lounge, I was exposed to the artwork and sounds of Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, the launch of a long anxiety riddled appreciation for H.G. Wells' terrifying fin de siècle, fin de monde scientific romance. When it was published in 1897, first in serial form in Cosmopolitan, although not the Cosmo we know today, the Victorian readers will have been filled with optimism regarding technology and the new world it would bring into the new century. Wells, on the other hand, thought, no, have a bit of shock and awe. Come with me and imagine life at the end of the sharp and irresistible stick we've been doling out to the rest of the world, your peace shattered and your comfortable routines rendered utterly irrelevant. It's been a cornerstone of genre fiction ever since, and, in terms of influence, Wells' writing remains shot through it, including the work of Michael Moorcock. I'm joined by author, musician, and avowed War of the Worlds fan Alistair Thompson, and you'll remember him from our episode when we talked about his novel, The Music of the Spheres. I take some Back's Rescue Remedy, and we look at the novel, the album, some of the films and TV adaptations and spin-offs, the authorised sequel, and some other bits and pieces too. So sit back, listen to the soft sounds of the working train chuffing contentedly by, but pack a cart just in case you need to flee, and join us in Derry and Tom's as we cling firmly to our hats and discuss The War of the Worlds. No one would have believed, in the last years of the 19th century, that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. No one could have dreamed that we were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets. And yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. Well, I don't know quite how to follow that, other than to say what a massive welcome back to Alistair Thompson, to Derry and Toms, and thank you for that incredibly rich and sonorous introduction it from War a, of the Worlds. an honour to be here at the top floor of Derry and Toms. <laughs> Where we, we spent so much time with the Cornelius family. So, absolutely. Yes. Well, you know, it's lovely to have you back. It must have been over a year, maybe, since we did Music of the Spheres, or was it, it even is, the year before? I can't it's remember. Probably a, a couple of years, yes. And mm. uh, you were very kind to help me plug that little novel. And how's that going? It went all right. Um, I didn't do a lot of promo for that. I hmm. didn't have the stomach for it. So it ended up because I wanted you know, the maximum amount of people to hear it, I ended up putting it on the internet archive for free. So I got, you know, it's a professional quality EPUB and all that stuff. And it's been downloaded, uh, you know, over a thousand times there. So I assume oh, cool. some of those people have enjoyed it. It also kind of fit more with the whole socialism thing. It's like, here's a, here, mm. here's a free book, my, my workers, peoples of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we are not here to talk music of the spheres on this occasion, but when we talked last time, we did have a quick conversation afterwards about having you back at Derry and Tom's and what potentially that subject matter can be. Now, I think most people will have twigged what that is from your introduction. But of course, we had a very quick conversation and you said you'd love to cover War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. So here we are. And that's what we're here to talk about right now. So the first question, why War of the Worlds? Why is it so close to your heart? Well, uh, as you can probably tell from that introduction, my introduction to that story was the Jeff Wayne album. Mm. And so my family, even though I'm Canadian, my family is all British and I was born there. So on one of our trips uh, to visit family, and I think I was about five years old, something like that. So the late seventies, um, my auntie, who was sort of like younger than my mother and cooler, um, she had the <laughs> LP of that. So my sister and I heard that, you know, it, it scared the crap out of us, but it was, you know, it was very compelling. And, you know, I, I, I didn't know at the time that it was, you know, some saucy disco prog either. I just, mm. the tunes were, you know, really 
really big and emotional, whatever. It really drew me into the story. And that was before, obviously, I started reading grown-up books. It was a few years later when I started mm -hmm. reading things like Moorcock and Wells and whatever. But it was, it was the album that got me. And, of course, you've covered Forever Autumn on one of your albums, haven't you? I did. And that was actually one that took me about 30 years after I wanted to record a version of it to actually figure out maybe my skills had developed to figure out the right voicings and the right chords and the right mm -hmm. style to do it. And eventually I, I felt ready to do that and uh, I put it out. So it's out there, folks. When did you get to the book? Well, it must have been, I was a good reader. I mean, my mother had me reading Lord of the Rings when I was 10 or something like that. But mm -hmm. I mean, it just I think I told you the story of how I got um, the Warlord of the Air in a train mm. station in the UK. And it was around that time that I started reading a lot of science fiction. It's probably around the age of 12. I mean, I read, I read 1984. I read a lot of books I shouldn't have been reading, like Behold the Man. That was definitely one I should not have read <laughs> <laughs> at the age of 12 or 13. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I read, first read The War of the Worlds around that time too. Yeah. Well, your introduction to War of the Worlds is frighteningly similar to mine because what year did it come out, the Jeff Wayne album? 78, 79? 78. 78. 78, yeah. We do have a link with Pops on this because whilst Pops didn't give me a copy of The War of the Worlds, the link is that I was in Nana and Pops' house as a six or seven-year-old and my uncle came in, my uncle Phil, with a brand new album. Yeah. And it was Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. Yeah. And I can distinctly remember it was an autumn evening, the nights were drawing in, and he put the album on, and I sat and looked through the booklet of artwork, and it scared the piss out of me. Yeah, those pictures are quite something. I was absolutely terrified. But because I was going through it, and I was listening to the music as well, I found it so unsettling, because it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. And we'll get to talking about the album a little bit more, I think, but I don't think there's ever been anything else that sounded anything like it with the possible exception of his Spartacus album, <laughs> which, you know, I'm not entirely sure about that, but some of those tones. And also he did the soundtrack to a film called McVicar. Mm -hmm. And some of those keyboard sounds that he uses on War of the Worlds are on that soundtrack as well. But apart from that, it doesn't sound like anything else. And that absolutely, it, it unsettled me so much that even to this day, and I'm now 50, I can't listen to War of the Worlds or see the images from that album without experiencing a sense of anxiety. It's stuck with me ever since. And then That's interesting. Pro and probably my next experience of it was seeing the George Powell Byron Haskin film from 1953 right. when I was a Cub Scout. By this time, I'm probably 10 or 11. And I really hated going to the Cubs. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> And I used to go to the Cubs at six o'clock every Tuesday night. And at six o'clock on BBC Two on a Tuesday night, they put on a, se a series of science fiction films. This Island Earth, Things to Come, all sorts of things. The Time Machine, George Powell's The Time Machine, and The War of the Worlds. And that's the first time I ever saw the pa George Powell War of the Worlds film. And whilst it didn't unsettle me as much as the album did, because of the connections with the album, I still had a sense of being unsettled by that. But I didn't read the book until I was a, a late teens stoner and I was at my girlfriend's house in bed and she'd gone to work and her mum had gone to work. She lived with her mum. And I laid in bed and read it from cover to cover. Um, I must have just laid in bed all day and read The War of the Worlds from cover to cover. And it absolutely blew me away. I understood, so I understood where the source material came mm -hmm. from. And again, we're going to talk about the book, but I was absolutely staggered by how good a book that is and this is probably i don't know 35 years ago and i just reread it last week so that book is now 125 years old thereabouts something like that i didn't check up on that but yeah 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 and it is still an absolutely incredible propulsive <clears throat> page turning terrifying read as it probably was ever has been it's an I would argue book. it's it's Wells' best book by a long shot. But, mm. I mean, I like others of his books, but yeah, it's an incredible it, piece of work. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons when we're going to get into all this. But that's one of the reasons why most of the adaptations are so disappointing is that they don't, you know, yes, they don't follow certain aspects of that book that we may feel they they should have, and that's that's another whole line of discussion there about what what's an appropriate adaptation of a novel because that's always mm. controversial, right? Especially with science fiction and fantasy. 
Uh, oh, yeah. You know, with the, like the people either love or loathe uh, yeah. Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, you know. And so it's, it's a similar sort of thing. I can't think of another book that I've read. And most of the science fiction and fantasy I read is, tends to be older. I don't read that much modern science fiction and that much modern fantasy. I should do, really. I should put more effort in. But having just read The Master of Man- Massacre of Mankind, it's put me <laughs> off. <laughs> well, there's there's a there's a lot of I mean, if you want to catch up on even the biggest names of today, it's a lot of reading to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we'll get to the massacre of mankind. But I suppose to the uninitiated, I, I can't imagine there's anybody out there who doesn't know what the War of the Worlds is. But let's just assume for a second that there are people who really have only seen the Steven Spielberg film. Right. What is the upshot of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds? Well, I think it could be argued that it's it, it's it's always dangerous to say something is the first because someone will always find it antecedent. But it's probably mm. the first modern science fiction novel that involves the idea of an alien invasion. Mm. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of good science fiction around that time that was starting up. You know, there's Verne and there's William Morris did some, and there's you know there's other more obscure ones. But Wells was the Wells and Verne were the big names, mm. um, and so it's you know it's the first ever science era and the science was the victorian era was big for science it, mm. it was the idea that science was the technology were coming along to save us from the darkness of the, the dark ages yeah this is why yeah. they were often referred to as scientific romances i don't think science yeah. fiction had been coined as it no, talked the about as even, scientific romance the term hadn't even been coined back then mm. and so it posits this, it also posits an interesting scenario in where human beings are not the top of the mm. you know the totem pole as we are on this earth and so it, it's the first, probably the first novel that presents a situation in which human beings are, you know, en masse in total are the victims. That's not, say, like, you know, biblical, biblical yeah. plague or, or whatever. And so in the War of the Worlds, we're invaded by Martians because that was the, you know, they didn't know about Mars back then, or whether it was populated or whether it had vegetation or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, the Martians are coming in, they're treating human beings like lower animals as a source of food, as something to be eradicated. Uh, and so the, that's you know that's a, that's a mind blowing idea, especially for people mm. who have never considered that before. Mm. And that probably you know uh, I don't want to push the conversation ahead too fast, but that's probably part of the reason for the you know the, the lingering notoriety of it is is that yeah. idea. But I mean that was a bad pricey of the book. But anyway, the Martians invade, and for some reason, of course, they're mainly invading the UK because Britannia ruled the world at that time. So the Martians right. somehow knew that they should invade Britain first. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't know about bacteria, but they knew they should invade London first. Yeah, lock, <laughs> lock the head off the beast. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, and so they start, you know, decimating the population, setting up their camps, and then, you know, at the end, they're defeated by the humblest of all creatures. Mm. I think <laughs> one of the things that makes it so compelling, I think that there's even a line towards the beginning where the narrator says something along the lines of, "It's so peaceful and tranquil, and it's incredible how quickly that was disturbed," and. It is an incredibly compelling opening because the narrator is uh, a journalist of some description. He's in this sleepy part of the suburbs outside of London. Where, yeah, the, you know, the home, you know, the peaceful home counties during yeah. the Empire, you know, yeah. everything's well kept. Yeah, the steam trains softly go chuff, chuff, chuff. Mm. Shunting in the so. distance. That's yes. right, yes. yeah. And everybody just has this pastoral existence. Now, I think this is... If you were going to level any criticisms at the novel with a modern eye, it would be that Wells' uh, uh, picture or vision of London and the suburbs is incredibly middle class. That's right. While while there are references to perhaps um, people not of that societal class structure later in the book, very broadly, this is a very middle class view of... Uh, a disaster. Well, that's and, interesting for someone considered a socialist as well. Yeah, yeah. And, but I suppose in 1895, a lot of middle class, very educated people were le- left leaning, weren't they? And, they and were Wells, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wells was definitely one of those types. And th- there are s- some bits where it almost reads quite whimsically. As a result, when you read it with with a modern eye. And, oh, shit, I was just about to read something, and I picked up the Stephen Baxter book by accident. I'll put that back down again very quickly. So I've got my, <laughs> my, my nice little 
hardcover of the Wild right, of the Wilds. I, I have here. a green, green cloth yeah. bound version. Yeah, here. it's lovely. Only problem is the writing's fucking tiny. Very so tiny. My eyes are going to struggle a little bit. But there's this wonderful bit where he's, he's been talking to the scientist, the astronomer, Ogilvy, and this cylinder has landed on Horsell Common. And nobody really knows what's going on yet, but it's all getting to be a little bit sinister. And people are going and they're looking and they're they're effectively there to see the marvel of the meteorite that's landed on Horsell Common. But it starts at one point to unscrew. And this is one of the brilliant bits on the Jeff Wayne album as well, that bum 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 bum. Boom, boom, boom. I've learned it's, that. I've learned that baseline. Yes. Yeah. And, and you get the, the sound effect of the unscrewing. It's wonderful. Yes. But Ogilvy heads back into town. And because it's been unscrewing, Ogilvy shouts, Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash upon Mars. Because, of course, he's been observing flashes on the surface of Mars. And it says, The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. At that he stood, irresolute for a moment, then turned, scrambled out of the pit and set off running wildly into working. The time must have been somewhere about six o'clock. He met a wagoner and tried to make him understand, but the tale he told in his appearance was so wild, his hat had fallen off in the pit, that the man simply drove on. He was equally unsuccessful with the pot man who was just unlocking the doors of the public house by Horsell Bridge. The fellow thought he was a lunatic at large and made an unsuccessful attempt to shut him in the tap room. That sobered him a little, and when he saw Henderson, the Lundell journalist, in his garden, he called over the palings and made himself understood. That's just, that's just absolutely brilliant. No, the ha- genius of that is the way it's juxtaposing the, the, the mundane and the peaceful and the tranquil with what's to come. It's, yeah. you know... Yes, yeah. it's quite something, yeah. Yeah, and I just love the fact that he he obviously looked dishevelled and agitated because his hat had fallen off. No, he, was, he was running down the street without a hat. The gentleman He's, at that time must have a hat, yes. Yeah, but of course, as we know, as that novel goes on, everything goes pretty horrific fairly quickly. Many hats and are lost, yes. Many hats are lost, <laughs> many hats are incinerated, and uh, yeah, it all goes it all goes south pretty quickly. Now... Again, one of one of the things that impresses me about this book is, in many ways, you could say that the language is quite dry. But as a result of that, it's all the more horrifying. Because... That is the, that's the genius of it. That's another thing that's not really appreciated about it is it's through the point of view of this character who's a journalist. Yeah. And he's relaying this in a very matter-of-fact way. So even some of the most horrible things that are described or inferred, it's all delivered in this not very dramatic way, almost mm-hmm. like he's reporting this back to you. Yeah. And and that's part of the genius of the style of that. It's not over the top. Mm. You know, it's similar. It's a different kind of writer, but you know how in, in Lovecraft, you never see the monster. Mm. It, just, it says, you know, it was eldritch. So, you know, it, it, just to picking a style and sticking to it, you know, consistently throughout the narrative, that's, I mean, that's, that's the genius of that POV in this novel. I think. Yeah. Uh, Lovecraft gets a lot of stick from people who say he was a bad writer. But I think when you pick up a Lovecraft collection and you start off with Cellarface or mm-hmm. something like that, and it's incredibly flowery and lacks a level of directness that makes it seem a little bit like he's trying to hard. People judge him, his entire body of work on that. But actually, if you read something like At the Mountains of Madness, it's written in quite a similar style. It's very direct. It's very dry. The horror is um, sometimes described, but most often insinuated. But when he does actually get into describing people just bursting into flames because of the heat ray, it's genuinely terrifying. It's mm. genuinely Because disturbing. of the understated tone. Mm. Because of it it's instead of despite of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is really impressive about this book and some people obviously see it as a fault. Stephen Baxter certainly did when he wrote his sequel, is that the Martians are implacable and inscrutable and actually pricks. <laughs> the, the Martian, when the Souths kill people, they don't just annihilate people, but they do things that seem almost personal and vindictive in the way that they 
that, that they deal with people. There's there's a place where after the Martians have started emerging from the pit and people are panicking and people are starting to get on the road to get away and he's been back to dispatch his wife with the help of a local landlord's cart that, right. he, uh, that he manages to rent <laughs> off him. And to, to be fair to it, he does try and take it back later, but the landlord's dead, I think, from memory. Very very decent fellow, good, good yeah. British fellow. He, he encounters the artilleryman, who's not named. Very few people in this are named. They're just, um, they're just individuals. And he encounters the artilleryman. The artilleryman gives him some information about his experience. And... He is a horse and trap driver, effectively, who drags the artillery. He's not, he's not a, an artillery man in terms that he, he operates the machinery. And he's one of the few survivors, and the narrator encounters him. And the, the artilleryman says that he'd hid under the horse for a long time, peeping out furtively across the common. The cardigan men had tried a rush in skirmishing order at the pit, simply to be swept out of existence. Then the monster had risen to its feet and had begun to walk leisurely to and fro across the common, among the few fugitives, with its head-like hood turning about exactly like the head of a cowled human being. A kind of arm carried a complicated metallic case about which green flashes scintillated, and out of the funnel of this there smoked the heat ray. In a few minutes there was, so far as the soldier could see, not a living thing left on the common, and every bush and tree upon it that was not already a blackened skeleton was burning. The hussars had been on the road beyond the curvature of the ground, and he saw nothing of them. He heard the Martians rattle for a time, and then become still. The giant saved working station, and its cluster of houses until the last. Then in a moment the heat ray was brought to bear, and the town became a heap of fiery ruins. Then the thing shut off the heat ray, and, turning its back upon the artilleryman, began to waddle away towards the smouldering pine woods that sheltered the second cylinder. As it did so, a second glittering titan built itself up out of the pit. The second monster followed the first, and at that the artilleryman began to crawl very cautiously across the hot heather ash towards Horsell. He managed to get alive into the ditch by the side of the road and so escaped to working. There his story became ejaculatory. The place was impassable. It seemed there were a few people alive there, frantic for the most part, and many burned and scalded. He was turned aside by the fire, and hid among some almost scorching heaps of broken wall, as one of the Martian giants returned. He saw this one, pursue a man, catch him up in one of its steely tentacles and knock his head against the trunk of a pine tree. At last, after nightfall, the artilleryman made a rush for it and got over the railway embankment. Just the imagery there and mm. that on the on the Jeff Wayne album, I think it's David Essex plays the artilleryman, doesn't he? That's, and it says, right. picking up men and bashing them against <laughs> trees. That's right. So on the Jeff Wayne album, they just <laughs> take that, that one little line and just make it even worse. Yes, that the the war machines are just stomping across the common, picking men up and knocking them against well, trees. I I would dispute the assertion that there's something um, wrong or incorrect about that portrayal because you have to remember what uh, Wells was trying to indicate about mm. human beings. There are several layers of meaning behind all of this, and one of them is the most important to me, and another one that is often overlooked by people adapting it or commenting on it is it's it's much about how we treat animals. Mm. as it is about how we treat other human beings. So if you look at what the Martians are doing, they're coming down here, they're eliminating, you know, the threat, but also clearing space for themselves. And, you know, they're going to use some of us as food stocks. Mm. But some of the behavior that seems overtly cruel, well, I mean, that's kind of the pot calling the kettle, right? And when you look at yeah. human sport hunting, uh, you know, when, when we were clearing the plains in North America of Buffalo, mm. were we just shooting the ones we needed to shoot? Or was some guys taking some time to take some target practice at them yeah. or, you know, at, at the indigenous people while they were at it. I mean, all this evil that the Martians are showing is exactly the way the human beings treat other animals and other human beings. It's oftentimes with the, the joy of cruelty for its own sake. Yeah. So to me, that's completely realistic and it's one of the reasons why it's so chilling. That's right. It's because we're pricks to everything else in the world completely. Right. And when something that we have no power against comes down and is a complete and utter prick to us, and utterly destructive, and we have no power against it. It's genuinely horrifying. It's, yes. and it's deeply disturbing. And those passages are just really disturbing as well. Yeah, it's, it's horrifying on a visceral level, but it's also mm. holding up a mirror. Mm. Right? So, to mm. me, that's another reason why that's so successful. Mm. And it's another reason again why the adaptations fail. And... It's one of the primary reasons why the adaptations fail. Yes. Yeah. They have political motives more than they do ethical motives about general human behavior. They're usually picking up 
a human conflict and assuming mm. this is an allegory of that mm. you know but and this is why again i find the baxter sequel so baffling in its choices but again we'll get to that because it just it just misses out there entirely they're, they're, everything's coming in for a kicking today oh good lord Ex there's except more for to Je come except for jeff wayne yeah that's jeff holy jeff wayne's safe hg <laughs> wells is safe uh there's a couple of other things i like but yeah i think we've we've got some things to say we've got some yes. thoughts about some yeah. other things but going back to wells writing notwithstanding the odd old school reference that might require a dictionary these days so there it says he looked over the palings i have no idea what he means by a paling it's probably some element of offense but there's other things like he, he refers to flies in relation to railways. So there's, right. the, there's the odd time where there's a reference to something which marks it out as being maybe slightly more archaic language-wise, but it's very rare that that actually occurs. And for the most part, it's the first two-thirds of the book, certainly the first half of the book, is really a series of massively exciting vignettes. Disturbing, yes, but the the river scene at Shepperton is a fantastic example when mm. the war machines make it to the river and they meet artillery for the first time. And it is such an exciting portrayal of uh, what is essentially a science fiction action scene that it's incredible to think that, again, not only was this 125 years old, but very few people have written as effective action science fiction horrific action scenes mm. as he manages to do in this book well, and the economy of style that he has oh, is part yeah. of the reason why he's the the name we remember of course there's the ideas and and his you know his standing as a mm. as a popular author of the day but there's a reason why you become that popular because there is a bit of an everyman appeal to the writing i mean it's a bit like the rehabilitation of stephen king's reputation because when mm. i was a, a kid and uh, we were in high school and we all had to do you know, a novel study. And I didn't choose King because I was a little snob. I chose Chaucer. <laughs> I, was, I was an awful kid. I was pretentious. But all the other kids yeah. wanted to do Stephen King novels. And the teacher said, no, that's not literature. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. But now we understand that, you know, there is a literary value to what authors like King are doing. And the mm. fact that they have that popular style is not a bad thing, you know. Mm. So that's there's been a sort of a, a change in the way people think about that. But anyway, Wells is another one of those authors that has a great economy of style. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Le Guin is another author who writes quite a sparse, sparing, not overly poetic style. Plots get driven forward well. You know, that's that's part of the reason of the the appeal. Yeah, I think. and yeah. and Murcock himself is oh, definitely, definitely in yeah. that category I as mean, well. Th those Elric books are tiny, but he gets so much yeah. into them. Yeah, as as he does with Wall Out of the Air. Wall Out of the Air isn't a, a, a long book, but he packs so much in there, yeah. so much in. I didn't realize it was basically a tribute to to wells mm. really in some ways when i was a kid yeah and we are yet to cover wall out of the air on this podcast but damn it we will get to it because wall out of the air was one of my two first mococks i can't remember it's lost to history which which one it was but it was either wall out of the air or stormbringer because i got them both at the same oh, time like i said it was behold the man and you know that was a, that's a weird one <laughs> mm, it certainly is <laughs> uh, we've, we've been debating what to do about behold the man because of course, you've got the novel, but there's also the short story, which predates it, right. and which I think is most easily accessible in his um, Book of Martyrs. Or it was before the Golanx collections, anyway. You can get the short story version, which has less of the uh, the bits where he's obsessing over crucifixes and the, the busts of mothers and right. things like that. <laughs> Le less of that, more the, the core science fiction component of i mean it. but i don't come from a christian background so i didn't understand how sacrilegious that novel was at the time <laughs> i did later yeah what you, could, what you could get away with in science fiction eh? exactly yeah. that's yeah. what the new wave was all about mm. so this this book it, it continues it's exciting the martians use all sorts of different means to eradicate people there are some really really fantastic references to just like little vignettes where at one point later in the book, he comes across a bunch of people who've got the electricity working, and they've used it just to raid a pub and get pissed. Right. And they're all they're all in the street, hammered, dancing, and then at some point, one of them notices that there's a Martian war machine just standing watching them. And that, but at that point, they all panic and break, and it just starts scooping them up and putting it in the basket on its back. And, and then there's you know the black smoke, the way yeah. it's killed killed everything in a certain radius, and so you can see the hills in the distance, you know. Yeah. 
there's nothing there and the black powder and yeah it's very evocative yeah so 1895 20 years before mustard gas is being used in world war one H.G. wells has got the martians murdering people indiscriminately with uh with a chemical weapon effectively right. yeah which is incredible stuff Later on, we get the, the narrative kind of switches ever so slightly, and he starts to refer to as if he's remembering or, or capturing um, information from his brother. And his right. brother is making his way with some people to, and that culminates in the the infamous Thunder Child episode, which I think is possibly one of the most iconic scenes mm -hmm. in the book. Yeah. But before, before we get to that, there's this wonderful description of the exodus from London beginning on a large scale when people start to realise, even the city is starting to realise now that things have gone horrifically wrong and, and the people of London are realising that they have to flee for their lives. So you understand the roaring wave of fear that swept through the greatest city in the world just as Monday was dawning, the stream of flight rising swiftly to a torrent lashing in a firming tumult around the railway station, bunked up into a horrible struggle about the shipping in the Thames, and hurrying by every available channel northward and eastward. By ten o'clock the police organisation, and by midday even the railway organisations were losing coherency, losing shape and efficiency, guttering, softening, running at last in that swift liquefaction of the social body. All the railway lines north of the Thames and the southeastern people at Cannon Street had been warned by midnight on Sunday, and trains were being filled. People were fighting savagely for standing room in the carriages even at two o'clock. By three, people were being trampled and crushed even in Bishopgate Street. A couple of hundred yards or more from Liverpool Street Station, revolvers were fired, people stabbed, and the policemen, who had been sent to direct the traffic, exhausted and infuriated, were breaking the heads of the people they were called out to protect. And as the day advanced, and the engine drivers and stokers refused to return to London, the pressure of the flight drove the people in an ever-thickening multitude away from the stations and along the northward-running roads. By midday a Martian had been seen at Barnes, and a cloud of slowly slinking black vapour drove along the Thames and across the flats of Lambeth, cutting off all escape over the bridges in its sluggish advance. Another bank drove over Ealing, and surrounded a little island of survivors on Castle Hill, alive but unable to escape. After a fruitless struggle to get aboard a northwestern train at Chalk Farm, the engines of the trains that had loaded in the goods yard there ploughed through shrieking people, and a dozen stalwart men fought to keep the crowd from crushing the driver against his furnace. That description of order breaking down, of first the police losing it, then the railways losing it, then the railway drivers refusing to return. Again, it's, it's just one swift page, two swift paragraphs, that perfectly captures how horrific it is if outside of our front door all of that falls to pieces within all the space of, society, of a few hours. Yeah. Go, you go from normal to a complete breakdown of society within yeah. hours. And you know, that's actually one of the most frightening uh, pictures in mm. the insert from the album, when everyone's running away and the Martians are you know, destroying the buildings around them and the detail on the faces, it really captured. That was one of the more frightening yeah. pictures for yeah, me absolutely. when I was a kid. Out, out, of the, out of those, all of those pictures, it's the woman in the foreground in that right. picture with the blood on the side of her face and the expression of abject terror as she's fleeing down the street. But there is so much detail in that picture that you can mm -hmm. look at all the people in the flood of, of each one people. has a different variant of terror on their face, mm. and each one has something happening to them. And so that really captures exactly the scene that you're describing there in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, over the last 120 years, the reality of that has actually come to pass in certain situations in the world, right? You've got 9-11, you've got world mm -hmm. wars, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've got the destruction of entire cities in wartime, yep. like Stalingrad and so on. Yep. And so this almost, you know, it has more poignancy to us now. He was imagining a worst case scenario, but now we've actually seen that happen. So that adds a level of relevancy to that. In one page, he manages to d describe all that terror, and in that very matter-of-fact tone that he used, yeah, mm. is is a, is ahead of the game with that completely because the industrialization of the elements of society that we've come to rely on, like the railways, in a city the size of London, suddenly collapsing and not being available and plowing through crowds of people. It's well, just... everyone's thought about this, right? You, you think yeah. about how much we rely on the structures of our society and the infrastructure that it supplies to us mm. and how if everything was to break down, 
that's why I mean that's why post apocalyptic literature is so popular in TV mm. shows or whatever. Because if most of us would be dead within days, mm. and I, I figure you know I'd probably be one of them because I'd be completely <laughs> completely helpless. Yeah, so. without without these without these things. Think about all the people that wear corrective lenses. Mm. You know, the moment your glasses get broken, <laughs> you're done. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, that's 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 an interesting thing to contemplate. I can only run fifteen yards. So I'm done. <laughs> I'm absolutely done. Straight Depends away. If, do you have you know, do you have the it in you to do any looting and massacring? That's more the, the I, I suppose question. what what we do have <laughs> is we have the world's most ridiculous collection of wine and whiskey. So if the time ever come and I could get enough sandbags then if we could set ourselves up as traders, we might be able to keep ourselves <laughs> we might be able to keep ourselves in beans by by trading booze. Because over the years we have amassed so much booze and our actual drinking habits have slowed down and changed. I used to be a massive whiskey nut. And whilst I still enjoy whiskey, I don't drink a fraction of what I used to drink. But I still kept buying it at the same pace whenever we went to Scotland. Right. <laughs> and and going visiting distilleries and stuff like that. So I've got a ridiculous supply of distillery exclusive whiskies that I've not mm. touched that have just gathering dust. If I can keep mm. the the marauders out, then or we your, can trade. Or but if the marauders final, turn up, we're knackered. Your final days at least will be happy ones <laughs> permanently drunk. So Yeah, absolutely. They've had, yeah. They've had, as a side here that apparently there's new guidelines where we should only have a maximum of two drinks a week or we're all going to kill ourselves. That's been in the news in Canada right now where they're changing our alcohol consumption guidelines from you know you can have 10 to 15 drinks a week and be healthy to two and anything oh, above no. that you're you're dooming yourself. So So what do I do about my second grosh? Well, I think because um, you're you're talking to your old pal Al here, you can you can yeah. live it up a little longer. And I think also add, because we're talking about the end of the world. Yes, you can abstain for a little while afterwards, make up for it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I will. Uh, actually, I, I am slumming it with Grolsch. It's funny, Grolsch. When I was a teenager, was like premium lager. Yes. And now Grolsch, whenever I go in our local ASDA, is the only one that's still four quid for four cans. That was before that's the, only the craft I'm beer it. revolution. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Mm. All kinds of European beers used to be considered fancy, and now I don't know where how it is where you live, but they're the cheapest beer yeah. in the grocery store. Is all the you know the, the European name brands? Oh, it's true. Yeah. A, a while back, uh, we were in a bargain store. You know, there are ba there are bargain stores all over the place, chain bargain stores in in the UK, loads of them, and we're in one, and Red Stripe was seventy nine p a can. Oh, and when a again, deal. when I was a teenager, Red Stripe was like. Man mm. lager. Red Stripe was proper. You're a yes. serious m m lager man if you drink Red or, Stripe. Or at least an interesting person, yes. Yeah, possibly. Now it's just like, <laughs> well, it's just it's just what you drink on the cheap because you can get it from home bargains. <laughs> right. You know? Which, okay, fair play. I will drink it for 79p a can as well. I will occasionally spend, drink a beer that's £4.50 a can. Nine times out of ten, I'll regret it. But I will also quite happily drink 79p Red Stripe. Although... The pound Grolsch is nicer. But anyway, kind of going off down a, a beer rabbit hole there. That's a whole other show. It really is. It's most other shows, to be honest. We're trying to keep this one erudite. <laughs> so we, we get this We get his brother's account. We get a lot of this switch from a first-person narrative stuff to more like repertage, mm -hmm. which is still really great. It maybe arrests the urgency of the pace a little bit, but it's still really, really great stuff. And then, essentially, we enter this situation where book two is like you know maybe a third of the book you know, the first two thirds of the book is is the absolute destruction of society and order and everything else and then we get to book two where called the earth under the martians where it, re it reverts back to a really grim narrative where the narrator ends up essentially beaten by the entire experience but there's this wonderful couple of chapters where he's trapped under a house by a cylinder with the curate. The curate, yeah. It's a very symbolic character. Mm, yeah. Which, of course, on the album is Phil Linnett. They give him a name and An a wife. Absolutely genius, over the top performance. Yeah, yeah he, he dials it up to 11, doesn't he? Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> but the, uh, the the curate in the book is, is a very a very different beast. He's, and he's, he's in it more extensively as well. He's, he's, other than the narrator, he's in it probably for the longest period of time. He joins much earlier than he does in other adaptations. Mm, yeah. yeah. But he's a bit of a dick. 
Huge dick. <laughs> yeah, frankly, he was a bit of a dick. And the poor narrator, I think, is stuck under there with him for something like 10 days. Mm -hmm. And the Martians are outside hammering away, building things. They're peeking through the slats of a ruined house. And you get this... It is, it's actually really cool. You get a really protracted period where the narrator is actually observing the Martians. He observes them feeding. He observes the machinery. We get something else which you don't really get in any of the other adaptations, which is they brought humanoids with them as food. Yes. As, as, as yes, feeding not stock. One of, not one of the better aspects. but Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, still pretty disturbing that they've got these um, almost super passive cattle like human well and that's them. something that baxter sure went to town with in his adaptation oh, but, you know, but in any case yeah yeah so it, it's yeah. an interesting construction there because it allows you to observe some of the details that you wouldn't normally get to see in this situation so it was a really mm. good device so it ha yeah. serves that purpose then it also serves the purpose of presenting this conflict between the man of reason and the man of religion that plays out underneath this ruined house yeah we'll get onto the the george powell film but the the interplay between science and rationalism and and the power of god handled slightly yes. differently in that movie in this the curate is number one is a massive dick and number two is dangerous and number and he, three he sorry, represents the you know the old the superstitions and, and yeah. the helplessness of those superstitions supposedly in the in the face of this catastrophe because everything they believe in has been you know turned upside down de destroyed shattered yeah. simply by the arrival of the superior species. Yeah. There's, there's uh, a, a brilliant passage. Starts one of the chapters which culminates in his evaluation of the curate's character, and I love it. So the arrival of a second fighting machine drove us from our peephole into the scullery, for we feared that from his elevation the Martian might see down upon us behind our barrier. At a later date, we began to feel less in danger of their eyes, for an eye... For to an eye, in the dazzle of the sunlight outside our refuge must have been blank blackness. But at first, the slightest suggestion of approach drove us into the scullery in heart-throbbing retreat. Yet terrible as was the danger we incurred, the attraction of peeping was for both of us irresistible. And I recall now with a sort of wonder that, in spite of the infinite danger in which we were between starvation and a still more terrible death, we could yet struggle bitterly for that horrible privilege of sight. We would race across the kitchen in a grotesque way between eagerness and the dread of making a noise, and strike each other and thrust and kick within a few inches of exposure. The fact is that we had absolutely incompatible dispositions and habits of thought and action, and our danger and isolation only accentuated the incompatibility. At Halliford, I had already come to hate the curate's trick of helpless exclamation, his stupid rigidity of mind. His endless muttering monologue vitiated every effort I made to think out a line of action, and drove me at times, thus pent up and intensified, almost to the verge of craziness. He was as, <laughs> he was as lacking in restraint as a silly woman. <laughs> he would weep for hours together. I very believe that to this very end this spoiled child of life thought his weak tears in some way efficacious, and I would sit in the darkness unable to keep my mind off him, by reason of his importunities. He ate more than I did, and it was in vain I pointed out that our only chance of life was to stop in the house until the Martians had done with their pit, that in that long patience a time might presently come when we should need food. He ate and drank impulsively in heavy meals at long intervals. He slept little. As the days wore on, his utter carelessness of any consideration so intensified our distress and danger that I had, much as I loathed doing it, to resort to threats, and at last to blows. That brought him to reason for a time, but he was one of those weak creatures, void of pride, timorous, anemic, hateful souls, full of shifty cunning, who face neither God nor man, who face not even themselves. <laughs> it's a perfect love it. character assassination. Yeah. Right there. yeah, love it. Absolutely dismantles him. And, you know, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, the curate yeah. gets his comeuppance for being... Yeah. <laughs> For being a whiny prick who eats all the food, he certainly does. But I mean, I, I can't help but think that his, the character was deliberately created to say something about, you know, the religious disposition. I'm not saying yeah. I necessarily agree with that, but I yeah. mean, that was a time when the science and religion were in in conflict, starting yeah. to come in come. It's starting to come into conflict. Not not much, but no. Anyway, I, I agree. I agree. I, he's he's making a statement there about the the cozy middle class 
religious class, if you That's like, right. and 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 their, and their response to real spiritual emergencies. But it is interesting that that scene is one that makes it into a number of different adaptations. Yeah, what but, is interesting is how many certain key elements do make it into most, if not all. There's like there's certain mm. certain elements of the novel that they know they just can't. Yeah, but it never that, makes it intact. Yeah, no, it never they never leave it, it intact. intact. No, <laughs> the, the, the Jeff Wayne one is close, but Phil Linnett's performance just makes him sound like. He's traumatized and he can't deal with it. He's a, yeah, he's, he's just lost his mind, and there yeah. wasn't much. There's was only one song's worth of space for him. So just yeah, go crazy, Phil, and he complied. Yeah, we're not told that he's actually a loathsome prick <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. He just keeps shouting. That's all. Yeah, in the Spielberg movie, you get that scene, but they make an amalgamation of a couple of different characters, and he ends up being neither. And that Tim Robbins plays the guy they get trapped with. In the house. And he portrays him more as a you know the modern archetype in America, which is the the loony survivalist. Yeah. So he, Spielberg chose a different target, more specific to his time. I don't actually fault him for that aspect. Yeah, the loony survivalist who might, if you read it a certain way, have designs on your eight year old daughter, which That's is also true. yeah That's true. Um, slightly concerning. In the George Pal Baron Haskins film, there is no cure at all. There is Uncle Matthew who is the female protagonist's uncle, but he's uh, an absolute man of God who of gets burnt to a crisp for his faith. And the only adaptation I can recall that actually takes a really good stab at doing that scene is an incredibly terrible film, but that's actually the best scene in the whole film. And that's the Timothy Hines War of no, the Worlds adaptation. Unfortunately, I, I didn't make it. That far in though, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe I, I, I think maybe it, I should have. I think it's actually quite hard to find now, and I was still living in my crappy bachelor pad in Hull when I got that on DVD from America, and I remember sticking it on, and it was genuinely terrible. I really admire Timothy Hines for for making that effort to mm. make a period specific, oh, yes. a period faithful adaptation that is faithful on almost every single level, but his his um, ambition far outreached his capabilities his and budget, resources yeah his resources yeah but there is one scene which is him and the, the narrator and the curate which doesn't require any special effects it just requires a couple of guys acting out a script and it's actually really well done that's the only good scene in that whole film sadly but props to timothy hines for actually being the only person to ever do a relatively decent job of capturing mm -hmm. That scene. Yeah, so, well, we yeah. we thought we were getting one a couple of years ago, and we did not. Oh. We'll get, we will get to that. We'll get to that. No, no, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The pain. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So after after the the experience with the curate, we get a, a follow up with the artilleryman, where the artilleryman proves himself to be quite a quite a, a down to earth erudite, and his observations regarding the Martians and his idea of how they operate, the narrator buys into it, but then just you know, eventually realises that he can't just sit there eating, I don't know, spam with the artilleryman and digging a hole into the cellar to try and hide under the feet. And that's turned into a, a whole massive song in the Jeff Wayne album, isn't it? Uh, another great song, yeah. You know yeah. where? Underground. Underground. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They'll play each other at cricket. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but that he, he moves on. There are, there are a couple of great scenes. One where he comes across a woman who just seems to be asleep with a bottle next to her, but she's dead. He passes through scenes where the black smoke has settled and there's just dust everywhere. And he gets to a point where he's just completely beaten by this entire experience. And he's now thinking, you know what? There's and no it's way at out of this. that exact point yeah. where there's we no find way out our, of this. our resolution. Yeah. And you have the, the mournful... Oh, from the hilltop at Primrose oh, Hill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, the the as it's described in the Massacre of Mankind Baxter book as the Deus Ex Machina. And yes, they die due to germs. Mm -hmm. And I've got absolutely no problem with that at all because it's how I was exposed to the story in the first place. I think I've ever read it as an adult and never knew the story at all. Would I have viewed it in a slightly different way? I'm not sure. Well, it is the one most criticized 
element of the story, of course. Um, yeah. You know, you can view it through the lens of, you know, this is a guy writing in 1890, whatever, hmm. what, what was the year again? 1897, whenever this yeah. was published. Yeah, not 1798, yeah. And, the, you know, what they knew at that time about such things we know all about now, you know, virology, bacteriology, mm. all that kind of thing. I, I find it interesting that it's the one thing that in modern adaptations you could change to be more realistic. Mm. Um, well, first of all, they don't have to be Martians. The sun adaptations haven't made the Martians. They've just made them That's generic right. space invaders. Uh, what we what we know now, we know that a, a super advanced species is going to have scanned our planet to figure out, you know, what, what can be dangerous to them as an invading force. So we know that would never happen. Yeah. So I, I it's easy to forgive Wells for that. Unless we're watching but, Alien Covenant. <laughs> we, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unless, yeah, unless we're watching Alien Covenant where, where the crew all go down to an alien oh, planet. Oh, right, right, right. So yeah, I, you remember? You, you had me thinking of Prometheus for a second there, so I was briefly yeah. confused, but yes. yes yeah, alien so, so the, covenant, right. the scientists are idiots in Prometheus, aren't they? And well, the, the deeply, deeply flawed premises in those movies. Yeah, yeah. And, and in Alien Covenant, they they all... And this is a, f a film made by a respected film director 115 years later, and yeah. the same tropes... Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Exactly the same thing happens when they come down. Yeah, they come so, down, yeah. they have a wander around on an alien planet, and uh, start parking around with taking... They don't seem to scan anything. They don't no. seem to take any precautions whatsoever about alien anything getting into them and you know and they suffer for it but it's interesting that even steven spielberg saw no reason to change the yeah. bad ending you know so that morgan freeman could do his big narration at the end of <laughs> yeah what, what, so you know what let's let's start thinking about some of these these other adaptations now because all these things play into it so spielberg and who was the screenwriter it was um David Keep, wasn't it? So Spielberg and David Keep put together their idea for their adaptation of The War of the Worlds. And they hit some of the beats. It's got it's got quite a few of the beats. It's, it's in a very there. watchable film, yes, yeah, so I yeah. will say that. Yeah, yeah it's got, got quite a few of the beats in there. It's effective, it's got some great camera work, the tripods are excellent. But if you think of all the things that potentially they might have thought, let's do this slightly differently because we've got an opportunity to do an adaptation here, and the things that you would drop and the things that you would change, you're right. It is perhaps strange that they didn't think of something to tackle yes. that end. Because I, I read a there is a there's a war gaming pamphlet company called Osprey in the UK, and a few years ago. They started releasing fluff for settings and stuff that could be used in role-playing games and war games, but without any kind of system stuff, just all pure fluff. And they did one about War of the Worlds, which takes a look at the invasion from Mars in 1890-whatever and provides additional detail and context behind you know, the composition of the English forces and things that they found out later on so they extrapolate a little bit. Things are found out later on about the Martians. So there's little things in there about um, the find that the humanoids that the Martians bring over have been turned cattle-like because they all have basically have had frontal lobotomies care of the Martians and have a, a, a wire in their brains. So just little mm. things, just to add, add little bits of detail, throwaway stuff. But one of the things it suggests in there is, and it's in Massacre of Mankind as well, is that part and, the part and down chemical research establishment or scientific military research establishment, whatever it is, they actually put together a plan to get diphtheria, tetanus, syphilis, and any other diseased, lower-class, um, poor East End bum and put them in places where the Martians would collect them, and that would... That still doesn't help with the premise. <laughs> doesn't the help Martians with the premise. Would, they would have that all figured out. Yeah, but um, you, would, you would think that you know, if you're doing a modern adaptation, would they go down some route like that? Well, they would have to find some solution. I'm, I'm not going to offer that. I'd have to sit and ponder for weeks because it is yeah. difficult. It's difficult to imagine how a force that overwhelming from a species that superior could be de defeated by anything. Spielberg off obviously chose not hmm. to take that on. It is his, kind of fun that they kept that there, I think. It is, it is fun. I mean, I didn't really mind it. The, 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 you have to, in order to enjoy that film, you have to accept what appears to be the thinly veiled um, allegory or yeah. satire or whatever of the Iraq war, which yeah. seems to be going on there. The Martians are the Americans and the Americans are the Iraqis. And, you know, how, how Tom Cruise's son wants to become a jihadi, basically. He wants to charge towards the invaders and, you know, which, he, which is ridiculous. 
I was about uh, to say, I mean, the things that they do in that film, the, the change, I haven't really got too much of a problem with. I'll refer to one of them in a moment. The fact that the machines are already buried and the Martians are having lightning flashes. Mm. Because I think there's actually something in the book that might have inspired that. I'll get to mm. that in a bit. But the, the stuff with his son. I can cope with Dakota Fanning. and I can cope with Tom Cruise. Really? Right? Because I, I cannot cope with a child screaming for two hours. She would probably do that. Can't handle it. The screaming is bad and it's hard on the ears. But the fact that his son just keeps having meltdowns and saying, we've got to fight back, and then he runs off up the hill to join the soldiers, then runs off into a fireball. It's, it's facile. And it's, then they get to the end, and he's fucking alive. He's alive. Everyone's alive, yeah. Oh, no. No, that was terrible. The irony, you know, considering how much uh, trouble Tom Cruise gets in, in general, um, is that he is actually the best thing about the entire film, in my opinion. I don't think he's that bad an actor, you know, born on the 4th of July, some other roles that he's been in. So I think he actually very confect uh, effectively, not confectively, yeah. <laughs> uh, conveys what it would be like to be a regular ignorant schlub thrown into a situation like this and what's important to you and how do you react and mm. and you know his acting really is quite good it really does reflect that he, he's protecting his family at all costs he does things that he would never normally do and and that is in keeping with the spirit of the original story yeah I'll, uh, this, I'll hold my hand up and i'll say that i actually enjoy tom cruise performances in just most films i ever see him in and, yeah, he's a much, much better actor than he's given credit for and I know that he's like the, is he third in line to succeed Xenu and he can levitate <laughs> and all that business. Yeah, all, all that business, whatever. That's your business. And yes, there's obviously some weird shit going on over that side of the fence. But you know what? I, I generally enjoy his performances and things. Magnolia is one of my favorite films. It's fucking great in Magnolia. But you yeah, know. the thing, actually, I had forgotten the thing with the lightning. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't like that. I mean, why would they? Well, why would they why would they bury all their stuff underground possibly uh, millions hundreds of thousands who knows how long ago they did this why would they need to do that yeah i don't like it as a concept for the film but when i read this when i was reading this last week because in the last week i've read the original and i read massacre of mankind and a couple of other bits and pieces but i got to this bit in uh the original book so he's in ripley street and it's early on in the book when the, the, the war machines are out and about. It says, From Ripley until I came to Pierford, I was in the Valley of the Way, and the red glare was hidden from me. As I ascended the little hill from Pierford Church, the glare came into view again, and the trees about me shivered with the first intimation of the storm that was upon me. Then I heard midnight peeling out from the Pierford Church behind me, and then came the silhouette of Maybury Hill, with its treetops and roofs black and sharp against the red. Even as I beheld this a lurid green glare lit the road about me and showed the distant woods across Adelston. I felt a tug at the reins. I saw that the driving clouds had been pierced as if it were by a thread of green fire, suddenly lighting their confusion, and falling into the field on my left, it was the third falling star. Close on its apparition, and blindingly violet by contrast, danced out the first lightning of the gathering storm, and the thunder burst like a rocket overhead. The horse took the bit between his teeth and bolted. A moderate incline runs towards the foot of Maybury Hill, and down this we clattered. Once the lightning had begun, it went on in as rapid a succession of flashes as I had ever seen. The thunderclaps treading one on the heels of another, and with a strange crackling accompaniment, sounded more like the working of a gigantic electrical machine than the usual detonating reverberations. The flickering light was blinding and confusing, and a thin hail smote gustily at my face as I drove down the slope. So that description of the rapid flashes of lightning and the rapid thunderclaps... That's exactly what they use in the film. Yeah, well, they must have inspired it. I mean, that would have, yeah. that would have gone right past me. Yeah. Really. I, would, I wouldn't have thought to use that for inspiration. But yeah. anyway, it, it doesn't destroy it. I mean, it, it's actually, I think we both agree, it's one of the more watchable and ex acceptable yeah. adaptations <laughs> that's yeah. out there. I think it's all right. I, th I think that there are elements of it that I, I have a problem with, you know, obviously the sun stuff we've talked mm -hmm. about. I think it's a real shame they didn't, follow through on the heat ray i think there are a couple of reasons probably why they did that well and spielberg is one of the reasons yeah. because he has this horror of horror yeah you know i mean i know it's a long time since jaws right so yeah. you know there's the famous story about them removing the guns from the people's hands in et oh, yeah. when, it, when it was reissued i think he didn't yeah. want to show that level of violence and yeah. yet 
and yet that would the the horror is not properly conveyed like it's there's moments where you know when you see the people's empty clothes floating down in in, in the yeah. air and then that's that's a very eerie and evocative image but yeah. just having people vanish is a cop yeah. out the couple of things that occurred to me because I, I watched the dvd extras back at the time and it shows you i'm looking at the storyboards and on the storyboards it's all heat ray it's all fire so when they'd storyboarded it, it was still going to be heat rays. But I think you're right. The first reason they didn't do it is it would have been too terrifying. It would have just been too shocking and unawful to have everybody bursting into flames. The other is it was made after 9-11, and the image of people covered in ash True. was burned into people's memories as well. So I think there was probably an element of that as well, people running away from something being covered in ash. And the fact that Tom Cruise could later get home and realise that he was covered in the ash that was of, of people. And that is a good scene. Yes. Yeah. Gave, gave an scene. A, additional bit of um, spice. But of course, that. if you burst into flames, you'll eventually produce ashes. So he could have yeah, yeah. stuck with it. But yeah, anyway, yeah. He, he makes his choices. And, yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I don't mind. I don't mind the Spielberg film. The George Powell film. We watched that last night. I managed to download yeah. a copy of that, and we watched. I that watched f- it about three months ago, so it's mostly yeah. in my head still. So. Yeah, first time I've seen it in I don't know, twenty years or more, probably, and because it was drawn from the Criterion Collection remastered version, they got rid of the wires, so you can't see mm-hmm. the wires on the flying machines, which is which is nice as well. I was amazed how well that film stands up visually. I have to agree, and and part of the background for that for me is I don't generally enjoy Hollywood films of that era. You know, the pre-realism acting. I don't like the the cheapness of the way things look. I mean, old movie fans are you'll be screaming at me right now uh, if I'm going to watch something on Criterion. It's going to be some hyper-realistic, you know, Japanese thing from 1955 because they were already doing that, right? Yeah. So I don't usually enjoy Hollywood movies of that period, and I don't usually enjoy their sort of creature feature things either. Their sci, their clumsy sci-fi things. I know there are B movie fans who love those, and I respect that. But to me, it's not serious enough because I'm yeah. just that kind of guy. But I was surprised by how well they did manage to convey, you know, the the things that we're talking about the the, mm. the terror, you know, the 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 terror of flight, the horror, you know, the monsters themselves. The aliens were reasonably scary. So I was surprised at how good it was. And yeah, maybe I saw the version without strings as well. Because mm. you know, I, I was I was impressed by the special effects as well. We may well be at a point now where generations who watch that version of War of the Worlds won't know what the fuck we're talking about when we talk about the strings holding the models up. Right. Because I don't know when the DVD was remastered. It may well be the case that if you stream it or watch it on any streaming service now or get hold of a copy, it may well be that version. But I distinctly remember watching it on BBC Two in the 1960s, sorry, in the 1980s, and seeing the strings holding them up. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother me, but they were always right. there. And the yeah. acting isn't isn't bad. Like I say, I prefer you know, s- snobby European films or, or yeah. Asian films at that time where they were, <laughs> the acting yeah. was a little less plummy. Yeah. I think because you've got a, a bunch of actors in there, I mean, it's 1953, you've got actors playing soldiers who probably were soldiers during World War II because it's eight years after the end of the war. I think Gene Barry's great in it. And Gene Barry was never a massive, um, massive Hollywood superstar. He, mm-hmm. he, he, he had his time, but I think he's really good in it. He really sells the terror and the horror. And when he's running around the streets at the end as Los Angeles is getting incinerated by the, by the Martian machines. I think it's all really, really good. There are some things in it that did make me laugh. And one is when he first arrives at the beginning at the pit, when they've been informed. Because, all, again, all of the key beats are there, aren't they? Mm-hmm, the, the meteorite right. comes down, the pit's there. Okay, you get the square dancing scene, which is quite quaint. <laughs> yes. But there's there's a bit where he arrives to, to see what's going on. And our female protagonist, played by Anne Robinson, she who's playing Sylvia Van Buren, she's there and she's talking to him about, oh, Clayton is saying, what's going on? So, oh, well, Clayton Forrester will know what's going on. The famous... The famous mm-hmm. scientist Clayton Forrester's on his way. He says, how do you know so much about Clayton Forrester? She says, well, I, I did a paper on him for my master's degree. It's like, wow, so you've got this you've got this female character. She's got a master's degree. She's intelligent. She knows some of the stuff about what's going on. Next time you see her, she's just serving everybody coffee and donuts. And then does, later does a fair amount of swooning for the handsome scientist. Yeah, so. she swoons, yes. she screams, and she serves coffee and donuts. But at least they gave her a master's There's degree. There's a hint. There's a hint of a future for women, yes. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the, the do lay on thick towards the end 
the everybody praying in the churches. It's it's a very American take because you know I did some thinking about this afterwards, and mm. you know the contrast between the curate mm. represents Wells's disdain for certain forms of Christian thinking, and then the way this this American version concludes. You know, the modern America is still very much entrenched in Protestant evangelical Christianity, as we have started to see with, you know, the, the Trumpist crowd in the United States. But if you watch old, say, you know, news footage or war footage from, the, from that period, references to God by politicians were constant. Mm. You know, God is on our side. God protect us, blah, blah. Like God was very present. It was an assumption that this was a homogenous society of Christians as mm. opposed to the world we live in today. Mm. And so it, it, the yeah. fact that this deliverance was coming at the hand of God would was something that would be unquestioned. Mm. You would, you know, that would be, have to be part of a Hollywood movie of that that era, in my opinion, unless it was a particularly intelligent one, yeah. because you know this yeah. represents what the average American would want to see. Yeah, and they'll, they'll lay that on thick as well. Very thick. Yeah. At, at the end, he runs from church to church, ser searching for Sylvia. He finds her, and then. The church is just about to explode. Of course. Th things fall down on people. Some people get buried unlucky. They can't have prayed hard enough, can they? Some right. people get buried in the church by masonry. And then the Martian war machine tilts and comes down and slams into a wall. And they're all outside. They're looking. Then they see another one come down and slam into the wall. And he goes up and the hatch opens. That iconic scene where the hatch opens and the red pulsing arm Mm -hmm. with, the, with the little blister packs, little pulsing comes out with the sucker mm -hmm. fingers, and he says, it's dead. And then you get the swell of orchestral and choir right. music. And the narrator, prayers were answered. Yeah, yes. narrator, Sir Cecil Hardwick. I don't know who he is, but I saw him in the credits. Sir Cecil Hardwick comes back on with the narration and says, all the little things that God, in his wisdom, put upon our earth. Oh! Mm -hmm. and yeah. Our prayers have been answered. Yeah, very, very different. But of its time, I guess. Of its time. Yeah, you have to look at these things through a certain lens in order to be able to enjoy them. Otherwise, you just, you know, yeah, you get angry about it. <laughs> yeah, that was the third thing that made me laugh. The first one was she's got a master's degree, but she serves coffee and donuts to the soldiers. The, the second one was when they use the nuke against right. the Martians. And you have, all the, you have them up, up top behind the sandbags with their dark glasses. And then you have all the people on the hillside. When the nuke goes off, they all just go... Observe well, the nuke. So you got all these well, people you know, on the hillside. That's oh, how it was, though. If you see that the famous some, footage of the right. mushroom clouds and soldiers are walking towards it. Yeah. I don't know why I, I used that footage in a music video once, actually. Yeah. But it's shocking. You see the mushroom cloud is probably about a kilometer away. Yeah. And these guys, these GIs get up and start walking towards the site. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible how, how naive people still were about it. Yeah. yeah. But, but still, a uh, Rocking good hour and twenty five minute movie that stands up incredibly well. I, I did think. not mind spending that four ninety nine. That wasn't mm. bad. Now, did you at any point check out episode one of the TV spin off show from that that was on in the eighties? That's on YouTube. You you pointed that out to me, and the version that I thought tried to watch was um, so low quality as to be you know things were pixelating yeah. as it moved. Yeah, um, and I didn't get very far because it kind of it felt like a, a science fiction version of Melrose Place or something. I just I couldn't handle yeah. it, and yeah. I, and just because of the quality of the video, I wasn't able to watch much further. Yeah. And I could I could kind of see that it wasn't really going to stick close to, well, it wasn't yeah. really going to follow the story at all. <laughs> so. Yeah, I got about halfway through the pilot episode, and back in the day when I was stunned at midnight watching crap on ITV in England, just before something... This is how bad telly was in England in the 90s. Once you got to a certain point, there was no 24-hour TV. You got to a certain point, and then this teletext service would come up at about 1am. Is that 1 the one with the, the little little girl in the puppet, or is that from the 70s? No, no, that's like that was like a, a, a title card. <laughs> I remember yeah. that from Life on Mars. Yeah, that was like a, t a title <laughs> card. No, in the, in the 90s, when teletext televisions came out, and I, I don't know if you had them in Canada, I'm assuming you did, where... It was like a very, very primitive message board system. Oh, I don't yeah. remember that. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I will find you some links to teletext stuff. Um, English listeners will know what I'm on about. British listeners will know what I'm on about. Maybe Australians too. But there was a teletext service. And after midnight, when if we'd been to a nightclub or whatever, and we were back and we were, we were uh, you know, getting into our smoky hairs, there would be a th teletext would be on. They had this thing called Job Finder, where it would just th these odd strange jobs would come up on job finder and just it would just cycle through them 
every 30 seconds. That's useful, and, anyway, if you're looking for a job. You know. Yeah, it's really <laughs> odd. And other things you got on teletext, like you could watch, you, you could access um, TV listings and television reviews and oh, very odd. So before teletext would come on, the first time I ever saw the War of the Worlds TV series was it was put in the graveyard slot by ITV and you could watch it after midnight on a Thursday night or a Friday night or whenever it was. And I never saw them in order and I had no idea what was going on, but it was ridiculously violent quite nasty and mean-spirited. I think and you just, enjoyed it because you were drunk or something, probably. Very I, probably, yeah. I didn't know yeah, what was the, going on. The acting was was the typical of the worst of that period. And I, I think we, I, I think I read the article, isn't Canadians to blame for this? Wasn't it filmed in Canada or something? I don't know, but I know that Greg Strangis, or Strangis, the guy who was behind it, was best known for doing 70 episodes of Falcon Crest. Oh, um. So, I'm, I'm pretty sure there were a lot of Canadians in the cast, but I'd have to check yeah. that. But anyway, I could tell it was it was some Z grade TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I, I watched the first 40 minutes of that pilot on YouTube earlier, despite the terrible quality. Phil went upstairs to ring a man, so I thought, right, I'm going to take over the telly. I'm going to watch some of that. And basically, it, it kicks off with commie terrorists. And right. one yes. of them might be a hippie as well because he's got a long dangly earring. But commie terrorists take over a military establishment and they inadvertently release a Martian from the 1950s invasion. Because in this, they're not dead. They all went into stasis. The germs put them into stasis. So the military stuck them all in barrels. For whatever reason, these barrels look like they're in a timber yard because it's so low budget. But one of them gets released from this barrel instead of being weak and whiny like they are in the 1950s film, this one's like a fucking ninja. And it starts, oh, and it starts knocking off people one by one. That's blah, right. Blah, blah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, then the handsome scientist is going to save us. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the retcon a few things. The, and the retcon, the fact that the Martians, number one, they're not dead. Number two, they can take on human form. So they actually go into the bodies of these terrorists. Absolutely absurd. Yeah, but they could only these terrorists can only sustain having the Martian in them for so long because they start to break down, so you get all sorts of gruesome makeup on them. And I remember this from some of the later episodes that I saw where they would have really gruesome prosthetic effects of things dropping off people and noses dropping off as the bodies were running out of, of capability to sustain them. And so they're, they're doing it to make it as cheap as possible. So You're you almost know. making this sound appealing now. Maybe you I know should what? watch it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first episode is a bit dull and it is very cheesy 80s telly but it was so weird and nasty and they've done it as, as cheaply as possible so the aliens can take them over the population don't remember the original 50s attack due to some kind of collective amnesia that doesn't seem to be particularly well explained it's maybe explained later on and the hero is jared martin jared martin this actor who i only ever remember seeing in one other thing he was in a series called fantastic journey and i looked it up earlier because I remember it had Roddy McDowell in it, and it was a, it was when everybody was obsessed with the Bermuda Triangle. Right, so it was yes. a family on a boat get lost in the Bermuda Triangle, and Roddy McDowell's in it, Jared Martin's in it, and he's from the future, and he's got some kind of thing, some technological thing, because it's cheap. It's just a tuning fork that glows, and that's all I could really remember about it. But apparently, it was called Fantastic Journey, and it got cancelled after nine episodes. So how the fuck I actually remember this from seeing it in England? I've absolutely no idea. So yeah, Jared Martin. Curly hair, classic 80s TV actor, probably mm. was in things like Columbo and stuff like that. So these scientists from the New Pacific Institute of Technology, led by him and their mate, Lieutenant Colonel Ironhorse. And there's uh, plenty of sub, uh, subservient females, as I recall, you know, yeah. swooning over him. Yeah, so yes. that that is the series. And the second series, oh, yeah, they also retcon the, the aliens aren't Martians anymore. They're from Zortax. And they come from much further away. And then there's another race of aliens. It all goes completely bonkers. But then after the first season, the showrunner changes and someone else comes in who I think was, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was also the showrunner for the Friday the 13th TV series. They come in, the retcon the first series, make it post apocalyptic, kill off all of the main characters apart from Jared Martin at the beginning and bring in Adrian Paul, who was the Highlander TV series Highlander. <laughs> so, you know, raising the, raising the stakes a little bit by bringing Indeed. in a, a genre TV specialist. And, and it's weird because 
you know, we'll mention War of the Worlds Goliath in a bit, but you you know, there's a really, really terrible cod Irish character in War of the Worlds Goliath, that animation called yeah, O'Brien. So I did, I, believe it says, it or not, I watched it. So. It says, I'm an yeah. Irishman. Yeah, um, oh, Irish. Oh, yeah. Irish. Well, I'm an Irishman. <laughs> Voiced by Adrian Paul. Oh, amazing. War of the Worlds factoid. So Adrian uh, Paul was in the second series of the War of Worlds TV series. It's just one step away from Kevin Sorbo, you know. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And he was, and he voiced a terrible Irish character in War of the Worlds. Goliath. Gosh, Begara. He plays an Irish character, so he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or a fucking loo. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's the uh, that's the TV series. And right. Minor confession: I have both series of that on DVD upstairs. It doesn't surprise me. But I don't know where they are. But at some point, if I get made redundant again at some point, I'm digging that out and I'm just going to sit and watch you them all back to sit back. sit there covered in crisps watching yep. that show. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm generally covered in crisps anyway. I don't need to be made <laughs> redundant to do that. So I'm looking forward to that. So, well, we talked about that. We talked about the Spielberg film. We just mentioned War of the Worlds Goliath. So we might as well expand okay, well, on War um, of the Worlds Goliath. Do I you regret not... me sending you yes. that link? Yes, I had not heard of that. <laughs> Now, again, I have to show my my prejudices here. I don't generally enjoy animated movies. Yeah. And again, I know that there's very artistic, wonderful animated movies out there, and I just haven't watched many of them. Mm. But I will say that this looked good. Mm. The art direction was great. The background scenes were wonderful. Uh, and everything else about it was pure shit. <laughs> everything. I mean... It's like Team America, World Police. There's yeah. these super soldiers that have... They, and, and again, what, what, one thing that bothered me about this, that bothered me about other adaptations, is this assumption that after the Martians die off, that the Earth scientists of the Edwardian period are going to be able to figure out how to use their technology, mm. develop Earth human technology based on that. They couldn't do that. But anyway, they've done it in this, and they've also formed a, like a cadre of super soldiers, yeah. which are a bunch of men with big muscles and one poor woman that they're all going to hit on. Yeah, and you know it's got all these stock and trade. Let's get out of here. I got a bad feeling about this dialogue mm. in it, and the, you know they're fighting the the you know, their own Martians with their own special tripods, mm. and it's just the one liners are flying around, and it's there's no subtlety whatsoever. And that's the frankly that's the kind of movie that gives animated movies a bad name. I really feel for the South Korean animation people who put that because together. it looked great. It because looked great. The visual design is lovely. Uh, the way they implement the three D models is really good it all falls apart a little bit with the character design and the script is terrible and most of the voice acting is terrible but it looks nice and there's there's something i think it was the opening titles really excited me because you've got those that those black mm -hmm. and white like um uh, panels of art which includes things like the uh the cylinders launching from mars it's really beautiful yeah. textured black and yeah. white artwork you've got that quite odd arrangement of forever autumn over it's it which... no i'm sorry like I'm, i apologies to that guy but you know I, I i it was like a euro dance techno whatever did you listen to the end titles yes i, I did because it takes that arrangement and then euro pops it up to the max I know. it was it, it made me <laughs> sick but i mean give, we both agree that the visuals had a lot of potential and i yeah. think that with the right hands in the right hands, mm. like maybe some more one of these high end Japanese companies, like it could something special could have been made out of it. But. Yes. The other thing I would say about it is it's another one of these sequel stroke spin offs that can't help but weave in real world characters. Yeah, and they always do that because it's not they turn it into an alternate history. Yeah. So this one, it's got the Red Baron in it. Mm -hmm. It's got, uh, is it Teddy Roosevelt? Who's yes. in it, and he's got yeah. he's built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and at one and point he's on top of one of the Earth tripods with in his pinstripe waistcoat with a giant gun. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's terrible. It's well, so that's laughable. where it falls apart. It's the action movie. It's those parts are more based on 1985 yeah. action movies with Van Damme in them than they are any piece of literature, and yeah. that's just a cop out. You know? Yeah, it's not understanding the potential and the material that you have. Yeah, well, we'll move on from. War of the Worlds Goliath. Then. And my apologies to the makers of that, but I couldn't help myself. Now, one that you told me about a while back when we first started discussing this, and I just didn't have enough hours in the day to get to it, you've got to tell us about the C. Thomas Howell Asylum films, War okay, of the Okay, well, there's actually two of them, believe it or not, and I didn't yeah. watch the second one at all. They made a sequel. I don't know how the first one could have done well enough. but so <laughs> These, I mean, these it... Asylum movies seem to just 
the like a factory. It, oh. I mean, it's a bit like the the Heinz version in that it's a, a low budget version with, you know, the problem with movies like that. First of all, if you like quality, is there the they intersperse scenes of people doing stuff with a sudden image of really really bad CGI, mm. and it flashes back and forth between those. So it's so it's so jarringly awful, you know that 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 alone is bad enough. Yeah, the acting and the scripting is ludicrously bad. There's I mean, there's a <laughs> there's a there's a Busey, there's a Busey in it, Jake Busey. I mean, when you Jet see a Busey, Busey sailor quality, yeah, when you see that in that, you know you're in the wrong place. Yeah. So, I mean, I think C. Thomas Howell, again, like, you know, I mean, he's no Tom Cruise, <laughs> mind you, but he's an okay actor. I, I yeah. remember seeing him in a big plot arc on that serial killer show, that overblown show, what is it, Criminal Minds, where he played an, a, a serial killer antagonist. Right. And that was before I started watching quality TV. But anyway, he was on that and he was pretty good. Yeah. So I thought, oh, you know, he's done okay for himself since the 80s when he was a kid. But in this one, you know, when you, it shows you give a decent actor a bad script. Mm. where the best you can hope for is they're going to chomp the scenery away. Mm. That's what he's doing. He's got the hot wife, you know, the bar hot Barbie wife. And, and the, the dialogue, I, I wish I'd written some of it down, the dialogue where they're standing by the pit. I think it's like, I think one woman says like, ooh, this smells like ass. Or something like, that. <laughs> like literally, she said it smells like ass. I guess because the Martian cylinder smelled or something. Yeah. And at that and at that point, I was like, well, I'm only going to be able to make it another 15 minutes here. Yeah. But I made it a, a fair amount past that. But I mean, it's another one of those situations where a movie made on a low budget that's sort of fun can can be, you know, a good time. Yeah. In this case, it is a, it's not. It's a bad, bad time. Well, the amazing thing about the Asylum movies as well is that they have all of their own specific IPs that they tend to mix up with all sorts of things. And with War of the Worlds being in the public domain, I'm really surprised we haven't had Mega Shark versus War of the Worlds. But this is I find this confusing about the film industry in general. I, I just don't know how, even with the amount of expense, which is low budget, granted, but how do you make money on that? You know what? I, I'm, I'm absolutely baffled that they do it, but they manage to do it. They do Mega Shark. They do Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus. They do Shark to Puss. They do snow sharks. So there must be enough licensing fees of various hmm. kinds that I don't know. But yeah. Anyway, it, it, for a completist, this this C. Thomas Howell version, I guess, would be worth a watch. But you know, it's it's low yeah. quality. I'm sure I read as well that he either directed that or he directed the second one. I think he directed the second one. Yeah. So if C. Thomas Howell can get paid to make these things, and he says, you know what, I'll come and do it if I can get paid to be the director as well. Good luck to him. But yeah, I mean, it's I'll never get that time back, but good for him. You know what? I'm going to track it down. I'm going to watch it somehow. <laughs> I, I've sold it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somehow. I've just got to, because I, I actually quite like C. Thomas Howell. So I'll do it for him. You know, I'll do it for him. I, well, I, I, and I know this, the sequel was on Amazon Prime where the first one wasn't. So yeah, and, and I know oh. they're floating around. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'll just jump to the sequel then. Support his directing career. Indeed. Yeah. You mentioned earlier on, I'm going to leave the BBC show till, till afterwards, but you mentioned earlier on there was a History Channel for documentary. Well, which... there was this, there's this short thing, and I guess it was done for that, but it's called The Great War Martian War, mm. and it's like a short film. And, yeah. and you, I don't know that that was the origin. That's what you, That's you, right. You, it, you it, it, was, it was a fur documentary done for the History Channel, and it was done for the centenary of World War One, the, the, the I... outbreak of World War One. Yeah, so it flashes. It's very, very fast, fast cuts, and yeah. like, it, it, it's like a like a, almost like a music video. Yeah, because the music and the music in it is inappropriate. But in any case, what what's interesting about it is the way that they put a animations of the Martian machines that are actually pretty similar to what you would have seen in the original illustrations that accompanied yeah. the original book, in with this World War One footage, and yeah. the, and it's incredibly eerie because mm. those little bits, some other bits in it are are not that great, but those parts where they inserted them into First World War. Mm. Uh, footage are very frightening <laughs> to watch they're really really effective yeah i was quite impressed with it yeah when i saw it and it still does pop up on the history channel from time to time so well, if you're a war of the worlds fan check it's it on out. youtube youtube yeah. somebody's put it up there yeah so it's time it's time we have to mention the bbc adaptation. are we are we we're, are we skipping the um the, the so-called war of the worlds that was out at the same time or are we going to touch on that later oh the fx series yeah with just, gabriel just, byrne just a, just a, not long enough to to yeah. slide it i'm going to call it war of the worlds in name only yes i actually found it quite intriguing at first hmm. for the first interesting two three, for the first two or three episodes just because i wanted to know what was going on once right. i once i realized that it was just they were just using the name to sell it mm -hmm. 
and it had absolutely zip to do nothing, with nothing at all war of the worlds then yeah it, it just it only attracted enmity from that all i wanted to all i really had to say about it was this is an example of a, a type of show now mm. that i despise where there's an interesting premise whether it's scientifically or sociological or whatever yeah. And you spend every episode watching characters have personal disagreements. So yeah. um, Gabriel Byrne and Elizabeth McGovern are divorced or whatever. Yeah. And so the first episode, okay, there's people invading and there's like, there's there's um, robot dogs going around zapping people. But they have time to argue about how much they dislike each other during this. And it's mm. so unrealistic. Mm. It just really, really pissed me off, <laughs> I have mm. to say. I still made it through three or four episodes, but anyway. Well, spoiler, I watched all of it. I watched all three series. I hate watched it. Sometimes I will hate watch things and I hate watched it out of, I just wanted to see where it went. Uh, I was just at a point I thought that this is so outrageously, and you're right, it is a modern thing. It's take a sci-fi premise and just wrap it around. Make make it a soap opera. Yeah, people yeah. in rooms not getting on with each other. And the sec the second series made some changes. It wasn't any better really but it made some changes and the third series was an absolute waste of time well, I so mean, yeah i just i, didn't I did care, i wasted you know. 30 hours on that well, I, yeah. I mean i didn't care who was invading i didn't care if all those people died so anyway that's that well spoiler it was us from the future oh god <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for sparing me watching yeah. it yeah the, the, you know, there, there are a couple of uh minor complications on that theme but it's basically us from the future that's, so it's not not terrible. even aliens. That's terrible. And there's a, there's a reveal at the end of the first series where you think oh, something major is going to happen, and then the wreck on it straight away at the beginning of the second series and make it us from the future. And from that point onwards, there's barely any robot dogs in it. It's just people with English accents dressed like everybody else with guns trying to kill people. Well, people, you know, the British are the worst, you know. And but look at look at Star Star Wars, you know, mm. the imperial leaders were all British. So oh yeah. Uh, mm. Fucking hell! The headmaster from Grand Jill was <laughs> was an imperial admiral. In, oh yeah, for for people from people in England watching Star Wars over the years, just about everybody who was an headmaster on Grand Jill or was on or was uh, one of the older officers on the Bill or something like that. They were right. they've all been imperial <laughs> officers at some point. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I digressed there to that. No, that's cool. We had to mention it. We had to mention it. But was the BBC series for all that the FX show? Mm -hmm. Was was nothing to do with War of the Worlds? Was the BBC series? Did I waste? Did I feel like I wasted any less of my time watching the BBC series? I said series. It was only three episodes, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a mini series, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I entered that without expectations because it had already been out for a year before, so before I watched it and I'd read all the invective about it. I mean, mm -hmm. to to make it clear, uh, some of the things that people on things like Twitter will assault a show mm -hmm. about. Uh, like say if this show is is woke or mm. blah blah. I'm not. I don't. I don't prescribe to that at all. I think mm. putting in a female character who is showing some strength, uh, you know, to take to add that element which is missing from period literature. I yeah. don't have a problem with that. So I don't have a problem with Eleanor Tomlinson's character being there, and I don't have a problem with the way they're showing her relationship with the uh, Rafe Spall's character mm -hmm. would have been treated by other people around them. I think that's an interesting addition. Mm. It's it's the other stuff. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, like, it's like I was saying about Peter Jackson. There's stuff he did in the two towers that just did not need to be there and was about his ego. Yeah. And so this show is the same thing. So that whole premise of the post-apocalyptic scenario when everything is all mysteriously red for some reason, and she's just yeah. wearing this cloak and pining for the, for the dead guy. And yeah. somehow Ogilvy has survived, which he never would. I mean, you were right there when the cylinder opens, but here you turn up a few years later and, you know, like it just didn't make, it made no sense. And that, that whole plot, that whole tacked on aftermath. And what the fuck was Tiny Tim doing there. there? Why was Tiny well, Tim there? But because, well, because they were in love. They had to have a child, oh, you know. It was, right? just, it was just awful. It was but so the terrible. worst part for me about the whole thing was a scene where they are trapped in a building and there's these Martian spiders. The Martians are for some reason big black spiders yeah. wandering around outside. And the characters are having this really clumsy argument, like this guess they're the two brothers, about colonialism mm -hmm. in language that is very now. Right. So even if you were uh, a left winger and you weren't in favor of the British Empire in, in you know, the Edwardian period, yeah. which is when they set this one, I think you're not going to have expressed it in the in that language. So it just assumes a level of stupidity in the audience that is it's yeah. condescending. Yeah. 
It always so comes they, back to that Garth Marenghi quote. I know people use subtext and they're all cowards. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and it, I mean, in the case of this, we know that that's, that theme, that subtext is in the novel. We don't mm. need to have it expressed in, in that obvious way. And plus, and it's another situation where like, there's big spiders outside that want to eat you. Mm. You really have time to fight about this sort of shit. Like mm. you, you don't. It, to me, it's psychologically, it just doesn't make any sense. Maybe I'm wrong. I've never been in that sort of crisis situation, but I'd like to think if there were, you know, space aliens outside my house waiting to eat me, my yeah. wife and I wouldn't have been arguing about the, the laundry or whether I like her parents or, you know, what they show people doing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, my yeah. microphone blew up there. I was laughing so hard. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. You know. yeah, it's it's a perfect example for me. And, and I was really disappointed because when I first heard that the BBC were doing a, a period faithful War of the Worlds adaptation, and then when some of the photographs started sneaking out set photographs, mm-hmm. it, it looked fantastic. Yes, it looked it looked really incredible. And then it was supposed to be on one Easter, and the BBC actually trailed that it would be on at Easter, and then it disappeared it was never on and it didn't come on till the following year later in the year so it was delayed for a really long time for some reason and i'm sure there's a fascinating behind the scenes story about what happened with that series it's possible it was victimized by choices from above maybe they had a better story worked out because you know that happens all the time absolutely but it wasted a really good cast yeah and what it fell into the trap of was having something which is a brisk 130 odd page page turner with a series of iconic scenes and someone coming along and adapting it and for whatever reason they're jettisoned 60 percent of it and add in 60 percent of stuff that is unnecessary or nonsensical and then a whole another 50 minutes of crap like all yeah, the future to me, stuff that shows an ego in in somebody and that's why i use the the example of the Lord of the Rings all the time, because in my yeah. family, the Lord of the Rings was like our Bible when we were growing up. My mother yeah. loved it so much. And there's a difference between putting something in because you think, you know, it's necessary for continuity or, mm. you know, to bring a story more up to date or blah, blah. And then there's just like, you know, the hell with this, this famous author. I'm a genius and yeah. I've come up with this thing and I'm going to stick this in there and this is going to make it better. Yeah. And you can, you can sniff that out. Yeah. It, you know, that, that arrogance. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, you know, Joe screenwriter is going to show me how this story should have been told. I found it on Daily Motion, the crappy YouTube alternative, uh, a few days ago. And I started watching episode one. And I was watching it, and there were the scenes in the newspaper office where he's a struggling journalist and he wants the big story. And there were scenes at the Admiralty where his brother's at the Admiralty and they're talking about the potential war with Russia and all. And it, it was just 15 minutes of dead time. Mm-hmm. 15 minutes of dead time that just held things up. It was genuinely really poor. And that's that's the difference between what I was talking about at the beginning there, where adding in the you know the realistic love story was yeah. one that you could put that in, and that's fine. Yeah. But then the heavy-handed, you know, constant discussion about Britain's role in the world that, that colored every other scene. Yeah. You know, there's a line you're crossing there, in my opinion. I would have had absolutely no problem whatsoever if the Eleanor Tomlinson character had just replaced George. If George, just like in the book, if if his wife gets lost and he fears that she's dead because she well, that's goes, an interesting point you raised there because nobody ever just replaces the strong male character with a strong female character. They yeah, so get, to, so get rid of him. He was largely ineffective as well, too. Yeah, so, so get rid yeah. of him. Make sure that she's not tied to him because her entire storyline was tied to George, this ineffectual loser. Get rid of him and have, you know, give the artilleryman more of a character. Have her piled up with the artilleryman. I don't, mm. I, I don't care. Just You've introduced this female character of interest. Do something with her other than having a moon in after George and her entire arc being, well, our relationship might work. Oh, it probably won't work. Oh, no, I'm now in the future and, I feel, and he's dead and I miss him. That's her arc. Yeah, they're just like pining and pining and pining. You know? Yeah. Oh god, no. it's terrible! And Tiny Tim with his floppy hair. Oh no! <laughs> and, he, and 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 even the the Red Future stuff is like right. We've taken all this shit out of it of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds that we don't like. What should we put in? Oh, let's have some vague rape threat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, let's put some vague trope. rape it's threat in. It's like, standard what? trope. It's a form of assault on women to constantly portray women being assaulted yeah. in in these sort of trivial 
ways, you know, portrayed almost oh. trivially, like, oh, there's, there's an attractive woman in our show. We better have somebody mm. trying to assault her. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I've forgotten about that part, actually. Oh, yeah. And then just, just this Ogilvy's going to be the one to sort this all out at the end, you know, out yeah. of all the people on planet Earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. What a missed opportunity that was. But fortunately, with War of the Worlds being in the public domain, essentially, you know, maybe we'll, maybe someone else will have a go at some point. No, I don't think that I hold that much hope for that. But Yeah. Well, now we've bashed the BBC show. I'm, I'm going to mention, I'm going to give some honourable mentions before we move on to the Stephen Baxter book and finish with the Stephen Baxter book. But some honourable mentions about where War of the Worlds has popped up elsewhere. I mean, there was the unofficial sequel, Edison's Conquest of Mars, which was published in newspapers back in the day, like 100 years ago, but I'd never really seen it or paid any attention mm. to it. Christopher Priest wrote a novel called The Space Machine, which I read about 10 years ago. I went through a period of being obsessed with War of the Worlds spin-offs about 10 years ago, so I picked up The Space Machine, which is a strange combination of The Time Machine and War of the Worlds, where the inventor of The Time Machine ends up on Mars, and you get a look at the Martian um, society, and then comes back and gets involved in the Martian invasion of Earth. It's not an entirely successful book, but it's an interesting book, at least, that does some interesting things with it. And it's much better than Stephen Baxter's Time Ships, which I never got through. Sorry, Stephen Baxter. I, I, just, I can't get on with you. Um, there was the Scarlet Trace comic series, and I sent you a couple of those. Right, Scar- I read them. I read Sc- them. Yeah. They are my favourite Wells spin-off, because I'm a really big fan of Ian Edgerton and the art, um, Matt Brooker, uh, Matt Brooker, uh, Disraeli. Disraeli, his, yes, I remember his pseudonym. that. Yeah. Love his artwork. Love the fact that they, they go down the intertextuality route a lot in that as well. So the first sequel to War of the Worlds is essentially a murder mystery set in post-Martian invasion London, and they bring in a number of characters, much like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, they're bringing characters from other fiction, but they're not the ones you would expect. So there's a couple of heavies in it who are working for the villain, and it's Peachy and Danny from The Man Who mm-hmm. Would Be King. So just li- little throwaway things like that, which I really enjoyed. And the second series beyond that is actually Earth's Invasion of Mars and how things go badly wrong there. And there is a suggestion there that the Martians aren't actually Martians. And there's this wonderful map on a wall that she finds in this ancient Martian city, the, the main character. And each planet has the occupants of that planet etched above it. And for Venus, it's the Trines from Dander. For Earth, it's Silurians and Sea Devils from John Pertwee, <laughs> Doctor Who. I, I, actually, I've, I saw those about six months ago, actually. We were, yeah. I was rewatching them. Yeah, absolutely love it. So if you're going to be intertextual... Tie John Pertwee, Doctor Who into something. Yeah, why not? Uh, so they go down that route as well. But I absolutely love those. I love the artwork. And one of the things I love about it most is it is violent, scary, and nasty when it needs to be, mm. which I really appreciate. I really appreciate. What did you make of them? I like them. I mean, obviously, they're, they're very, very good graphic mm. novels. Um, I thought they were a bit heavy-handed, again, on some of the criticisms of Empire, which I completely mm. agree with. But, yeah. um, I mean, a graphic novel format doesn't deal well with you know, it doesn't lend itself well to super subtlety. So I understand yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I appreciated that, but I thought it was a bit, it was a bit heavy. Um, and, I, and as I pointed out earlier, I just don't see a scenario where scientists, when and I'm not even sure the special theory of relativity existed at this point, and yet yeah. they're going to adapt Martian technology for our use. Like, yeah. I just don't, I don't, they are, all these people are adapting it that way. I don't see it that way. But I mean, there's other things I really liked about it that I thought were clever, like how Scotland is this big slum that's kept in a state of abject poverty to serve yeah. the needs of empire. Uh, I liked some of the characters. I thought the female characters were used well mm. uh, as, you know, strong females. So yeah. I thought that was good. I mean, yeah, it was, it's really enjoyable. It's a bit action, action movie-ish, yeah. but, but for what it is, it's very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there's, there's a lot of heavy-handed allegory later on as well. I, the, the ones I sent you, I can't remember if it gets as far as Cold War, where trains that have evacuated Venus are living on Earth and getting jobs, and they're getting things daubed on the front of the houses like space packies go home and things yeah, like I that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, what, was that, what was that South African movie? Oh, you know, the South African one where the space aliens have landed and they're living in a slum in the townships? District 9. Yeah, it's much like that, and that's one. That's the reason I enjoyed that movie so much. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, District Nine. I'm definitely due a rewatch on that. I haven't seen it for a while. Uh, I love that film. 
So, yeah, Scarlet Traces, I think, is probably my favourite spin-off mm. of, uh, of The War of the Worlds. It has concluded now. The end was okay. I wasn't entirely satisfied with the ending, but it was okay. Then there was the Marvel Kill Raven comics, which apparently had tripods and Martians in it. I've, I did get the Kill Ra- I asked someone for the Kill Raven anthology or omnibus or oh, whatever never for Christmas last year. Yeah, I hadn't either until well, I started actually, looking at Actually, but now you mention this, I don't know if you're going to come for this. Remember the children's trilogy, the tripods? Oh, God. I forgot all about the tripods. The John I read that novels. a few years ago, and, and I just came popped into my mind right now. Yeah. Now, those were yeah. quite good. Yeah, there was there was a. I was first introduced to that not for the books. There was a BBC television series. Right, there was. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, it was it was like Doctor Who level of budget, maybe a little bit higher, but they never did the third the third book. They cancelled it, which is a shame. Hmm. So I think yeah, the first I can't one, even remember the author's name right now, unfortunately, because it just popped back into my head. Jo- John Christopher. Right. Yeah. John. Yeah, Christopher. I would re- I would definitely recommend people who are into you know, young adult sci fi what read those. Those are quite good. John Christopher wrote some really good books. He wrote one called The Death of Grass, which um, is known in some, some territories as Nurblehead of Grass. And there was a really, in many ways terrible, in many ways truly amazing film of it made by a, an actor turned director called Cornell Wilde. And it's um, it's a, it's like a 70s, a combination of a 70s British everything is fucked disaster movie and an exploitation film. It's amazing, and I oh. love it. It's out of order, but I still love it just because it's so shonky and weird. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. But yeah, well, really, see, really good book. It's at that level when B movies are enjoyable, right? Yeah, yeah. It's you know, so you've got biker gangs with Viking horns on the helmets, with yeah. old women with shotguns blowing bikers off their bikes. Of course, it's, yeah. it's just it's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, that it. was an aside. I remember yeah. those tripods. And then, of course, there's League of Extraordinary, Extraordinary Gentlemen Volume Two. Where, which is basically the story of the Martian invasion, if Alan Quatermain, Jekyll, Stroke, Hyde, and the Invisible Man were a part of a super team. Trying the first volume, it's Fu Manchu's the villain. The second volume, it's basically the invasion of, of the Martians. That's absolutely fantastic. It's got some problems. Um, it's got some of. I think some people will be upset if I say this, but it's got some of Alan Moore's worst instincts creeping into it. With that he occasionally has when he writes things, but the art by Kevin O'Neill is absolutely stunning. The Martian tripods are amazing. I think they're the best depiction of the Martian tripods I've ever seen. There was a Kevin J. Anderson brace of books. He, there was one that he edited called Global Dispatches, which is a set of short stories, some of which are terrible, some of which are okay, a couple of which are quite good. One of them is by George Alec Effinger. Effinger, Effinger, don't know how you pronounce it. And it's um, as if the narrator of the War of the Worlds novel, it's as if it was Henry James, and he was the one who actually wrote, okay. the, uh, wrote the narrative. <laughs> That's quite good. And there's a couple of other ones. And there's one as well. I can't remember who wrote it. And it's John Carter versus the War of the Worlds Martians for uh, for the length of a short story. That was quite entertaining. And he also did one called The Martian War, a novel which I didn't get on with. Kevin J. Anderson, I think, is the guy who co-writes the terrible Dune books since All Frank right. Herbert died. So, yeah, I'm not sure about Kevin Anderson. Something. So, yeah, that leads us up to, I think, probably unless you can think of anything else that isn't the massacre of mankind. The only thing I would point out is, of course, that Wells himself is a character in uh, The Dancers at the End of Time. So, you know, of course. That's, that's adjunct to this this canon. And then we've of got to course. mention our, our boy Moorcock here. Yes. So that's that's one of my favorite books of all time, and the treatment of Wells in that is very amusing. It's not directly related to War of the Worlds, obviously, but yeah. uh, it's something, you know, he's using Wells' character amusingly in that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting to Dance at the End of Time because I haven't read him in like 25 years. And the, there's. Oh, there's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to those. I'm going to get to those. But that brings us finally to Stephen Baxter's The Massacre of Mankind. Can you hear my, my Russian blue cat pounding on the door? Because if you can't, I won't I won't do anything with him. I can't, no. So okay, that's good. Because he, pound, must be doing he its, pounds on it. Yes. Yeah, anyway. Zoom must be doing its noise reduction right. job. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I, may, uh, yes. I may, may hear it when you, you send over your end, but don't worry okay. about it. I can sort that out. <laughs> so yeah, Jesus Christ, The Massacre of Mankind. I, get, I, I gave up halfway through, and then I forced myself to carry on with it. Because I did read the whole thing myself. I read it. I grimly read it. 
Oh. Um, basically, I want to be kind about this because it's clear that Baxter is a is a good writer technically yeah. and a good storyteller. And I know that this was you know an officially sanctioned mm. book. Uh, I know he's worked with Terry Pratchett. I know you know it's obviously this guy can can write. Yeah. Uh, I think he got so wrapped up in the idea of getting the tone right because he really did obviously make an effort to do that. Mm. That he the plot <laughs> got completely lost, and so that's the first sin of the book is the way he writes himself out of the plot at the end with this business of leaving signals for Jovians and the Martians will just leave or yeah you know that's that just makes no sense to me. Mm. The other thing that you know, some people might disagree with me. He overtells, and I mean factually. So the idea that remember, remember right from the beginning of our little show here, I said the Martians are treating people like animals. Yeah, they're not treating them like a conquered people, mm -hmm. and it's that's clear to me from the original book. So mm -hmm. why would you allow there to be human collaborators who you allow to go into your base and give people tours of your base and see people being fed upon and and look at the other species that you've mysteriously brought more than one. They brought more than one, you know, feeder species yeah. with them. Yeah. And so the, it takes all of the menace and all of the terror and yeah. all the horror out of it and it just makes Martians into, you know, some people that, you know, raided your village and set up camp. Like it's, yeah. it, to me, I wasn't frightened. I, I was barely interested. And, and that to me would, ruins the whole point. Mm. That's my take on it. There was one period where it grabbed me. It got me. So from the off... I was disappointed that the entire setup was basically saying the narrator of the original book was an unreliable wanker. Right. Um, yeah. and, and a bit of a tool, and we all think he's a tool. And, you know, he's off having PTSD treatment somewhere in Austria, and they're critical of the narrative, as it's referred to. The critical of the narrative, the critical of the ending, the, so the Deus Ex Machina is rubbish. It's like, why would you be so meta? about something that you're writing a sequel to, if, as if you're either acknowledging other people's criticisms of the original novel or you're, you're agreeing with those criticisms. Therefore, you weave that into the story and automatically alienate everybody who loves the original. That was my first problem with it. You know, yeah, it's just like, uh, what's, what's that film? Alien 3, where mm. Alien 2, has everyone's saved. Alien 3 starts, they're yeah. all dead. Because it's a yeah. different director. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm, but I'm going to look like a massive hypocritical wanker now because I love Alien 3. Oh, no, I love Alien 3 too. Yeah. But in terms yeah. of letting people down who were happy to see the characters survive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway. Yeah. But it, it got me. And when they have figured out where the first round of cylinders are going to land and they're positioning all the defenses and Frank, the narrator's brother, gets his, his doctors and his nurses and they set themselves up with their field hospital. Yeah, it was and, a good setup. Good setup at that and the, point. And the way, yeah. the anxiety was building in me. I, I, mm -hmm. I referred earlier on to how I've always, I, I always get an edge of anxiety when I deal with anything to do with War of the Worlds that's good because of that experience with it in the 70s. That sense of anxiety and dread started building in me as the reader. Mm -hmm. And within five pages, it had all been completely dispelled. Actually, that was the same experience now that I think back. It's again, it's a couple of years since I read it. And I, yeah. I really, I felt pretty good about the first, you know, third of it. Yeah. Um, Comple and then, completely then dispelled next it. Next thing you know, you know, the woman is wandering around the actual Martian base and the Martians aren't paying any attention to her because they're collaborating with the, with the other but, guy. With the artilleryman, Bert Cook. Yeah, right. That's who it is. And yeah. he's living on their territory with a, well, with a wife and kids or something. And yeah. just, I was like, what is going on here? At that point, I started to think, well, he's overstretched. Yeah. He can't, how's he going to get back from this? Yeah. And he didn't. The Martians are living at the North Pole, and they, there's another species that lives on Jupiter, and they're more. the Martians are scared of them. Yeah. Like, was, where did that come from? I can't believe I read through. You know how I felt towards the end? was I felt like I did when I got to the end of The Stand. And I just thought, I can't believe I read, well, in the case of The Stand, I can't believe I read 760 fucking pages. Is that all it was? I thought it was more like 15,000 pages. Oh, I have no <laughs> idea. But I can't, I can't believe I read all those pages to get to those last two pages for that deus ex machina ending mm. of The Hand it, of God. And to me, it's, it's even more disappointing with a book like this because I could tell that this guy's got the goods. Yeah. It's more like if somebody just stinks. And remember, I'm a professional editor. And so... Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of bad writing in my day, and I've seen surprisingly good writing. Mm -hmm. I've seen great writing. And, you know, some of my, my clients write bad stories well, and some of them write 
you know, mm. oh, what's the opposite of that? They write well with bad stories. But anyway, this is a case <laughs> of, of a man who can write well, yeah. writing a bad story. Yeah. And so I so it wouldn't stop me from reading more of his work, probably, but yeah. maybe something more original. Yeah, I've never read anything else by him, but I tried reading The Time Ships, which was his authorized sequel to The Time Machine. Right. And I gave up about a third of the way through, I think. Okay. Well, not a um, ringing endorsement. but No, but yeah, I think you're right. I think for the sake of even-handedness, I might try and find something original that is written that's his own thing and give it a look. Because, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a... Uh, a writer or a talent or a, an editor or anything like that. I can only kind of read by the emotional reaction that I get to it. And the the idea that these, you're absolutely right, these colonizers that treat you like um, the dodo. Food. Like food. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the idea that it's not just the way they react to the humans, the way the humans react to the Martians is they're all plucky. All of the human characters are plucky in the face of everything that goes on. And there are a couple of occasions where Julia, the, the protagonist, refers to she'd seen the hell inside the cordon. And when she's inside the cordon, it's like, I don't know. It's all stiff upper lip in there. It's like Vichy yeah. France or something. Yeah. Martians are sucking my blood, but oh, jolly good, when's tea time? Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it didn't even add up itself in an... There were isolated bits of six or seven pages where even the internal logic of the motivations and the behaviour of the characters just didn't stack up. And Baxter also had a really bad habit of dispelling drama by saying things... There's a key character in it. And at one point, several chapters before this happens, he says, um, the, the, the narrator, Julia, says, well, she wouldn't make it, and we realise later on how much would miss her. And then you, you're with that character, some to that effect. You're with that character for the four or five chapters to get all right. When's she dying then? Because you've mm. you've told us that she doesn't make it, and there's a, there's a really bad habit of ending paragraphs with "we would find out that." Oh, dot, I dot, always dot, tell dot. people to remove that from there. But if you finish a chapter with "we didn't know what was coming, but we'd soon find out," like that's that's a very bad mm. habit. Mm. But I think in, in in this case, it may have been. I would have to analyze his other books, I guess, but it may have been an attempt to write in a period style because that's mm. what that comes from. Yeah. But right? if, that's, really... if, that's at, if that's at the expense of story logic. Yeah. But he was really trying hard to master that sort of Wellesian style. And I, I think that's really what happened here is he mm. neglected other aspects. Yeah. He also need, he needed an editor like you to chop 200 pages out of it. Well, someday my time will come, and these celebrity authors will start hiring me. You know, someday. <laughs> anyway, it was a, it was a bit of a disappointment. It was no uh, no Jeff Wayne. No, that's all I can say. That really wasn't. So yeah, I think to to wrap this up, why and how has the War of the Worlds stood the test of time? I think you've you've mentioned some of that already. The 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 fear of the apocalypse is still massive in fiction. Massive in fiction, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We just recently watched Station Eleven, right. a TV series about a, a post-apocalyptic, post-virus society, which actually was a really nice change because even though it had uh, grim elements to it, most people in it were fairly optimistic, and it, mm -hmm. it, it was it was it was emotional and quite uplifting in places. The Last of Us is now the biggest thing on well, HBO. I mean, just think of it. You could name 20 shows. I mean, I've tried to watch ones and abandon them. There was Tribes of Europa was one I yeah. tried to watch. Like the the post-apocalyptic is the probably the number one science fiction genre that there is. And there's, other things are tran tangentially related as well, like The Walking Dead, the most popular yeah. show in America, is basically yeah. a post-apocalyptic show with zombies. And you know, the interesting thing about science fiction and fantasy unlike other kinds of literature, you can trace them back to direct antecedents. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you can say, well, this person started a genre. Uh, so, you know, with fantasy, we know where all modern fantasy comes from. J.R.R. started it, and that's why everybody has orcs and elves and dwarves in their books. Mm -hmm. And what, well, there's other fantasy antecedents, but he's the guy that everyone wanted to be like, and it, his tentacles are in everyone's work. Yep. And with science fiction, it's the same thing. Verne and Wells are the basis for everything we read now pretty mm. much in generally speaking and the appeal of this book is shown really in the i mean the existence of post-apocalyptic literature dystopian literature all that stuff it, it traces back to this and the appeal of it is there's something in us 
uh, I think we touched on this earlier, but there's something that there's something in us that that fears to imagine what it would be like mm. if everything was just taken away from us and everything fell apart. There's mm. a fascination, particularly to these post-apocalyptic landscapes. You see them in whether it's in video games or whether it's in movies. They were meticulously constructing what a ruined world looks like, and you, there's artists who do that, right? They construct. Mm visions of london as a ruined place with vines growing everything and you don't you look at the picture and you're so fascinated you yeah. don't know why yeah. there's something in us and that, i think that's the appeal of this story as well as i think that most people don't consciously think about issues like animal rights let's mm -hmm. face it it's one of those neglected things in the world uh, but the way that we treat animals and the way the martians treat us is something very affecting about uh, that on a sort of an instinctive level the horror mm -hmm. of being treated that way I think that's part of the appeal of it. But the the whole idea of a post-apocalypse is just something in us on an instinctual level. Like I've seen that, um, I read the book once and I can't stand Cormac McCarthy's playing around with, with punctuation and capitalization. Mm. But I've seen the movie of The Road, which is mm. the most depressing movie ever made three times. Yeah. I have no idea why I keep going back to it. There's and something the, about it that's really fascinating to me. And the movie leaves out some of the worst things in the book as well leaves out some and it puts some in and yeah, yeah. nightmares about it yeah but you know that's another example i mean of all the books that that author's written this that's the only one that has that kind of focus and yet mm. it's probably this famous author's most famous work mm. so i mean that's that's why the war of the worlds is still popular why you know we respond that way to it would probably need a an anthropologist or mm. <laughs> a sociologist to analyze yeah, it yeah very true uh, but yeah. it, it works I know I, I'm not going to keep coming back to this, but it works best when you attach it up to some glistening disco prog and, you know, <laughs> with, with Herbie flowers on the bass guitar, you know, yeah. like nothing like it. That's, yeah. that's, that's my favorite musical recording of all time. And I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks about yeah. that. 70s disco prog, not Euro pop. No, I mean, that just sounded like the guy cooked that up in five minutes on his, on his Casio or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Jeff Wayne album, I mean, if you read about it, it's a remarkable achievement. It's the first ever 48 track recording or because they joined two things together with, with wires and tape or something. Yeah. You know, it, it was using cutting edge synthesizers at the time. And that, that sounds are all coming from this one, you know, they had the nerdy genius synthesizer player they brought in for that. And then they had the top session musicians in the UK playing on it. Yeah. Then you bring in, you know, Justin Hayward, who's, you know, probably considered to be the best male voice in the UK at that time. Yeah. And then they chose exactly the right beats to emphasize, right? We've been mm -hmm. talking about how they, that certain elements of the story are always preserved. Mm -hmm. Well, Wayne did the best job of choosing those. Because yeah. that Thunderchild episode is important in the book, but he takes it to this epic scale yeah. where it's literally, if this one ironclad doesn't do this job, humanity's doomed. Yeah. Well, if you take a step back from that and think about that, that makes no sense because this whole planet full of ironclads, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the way it's put in that, it's like, this is it. These guys do this or we're all we're all toast mm. and just that that scale that he managed to you know present there I, that's what adaptations of the story should have been aiming for because capturing yeah. that matter of fact tone we talked about that's appealing from the book i don't think that would be that easy to do that's, no. that's a literary tone so it, it, a movie is bound to be more of an action-based movie mm. which is why the spielberg one is probably the most successful because mm. it, it balances the action elements versus that little trace of thoughtfulness but, you know, I, I really think that the album does a half decent job of that. But th that could just be nostalgia, like that maybe my love for this thing is just like an incredibly oversized sense of nostalgia. No, I think there's a real reason why that album touched so many nerves. Uh, you know, the choice of Richard Burton obviously is uh, a major factor in that as well. The fact that you get a guy who's probably at the tail end of his career is it's only three or four years later he's making 1984, which was his last mm -hmm. movie role. Choosing him to do that and him committing to it in the way that he committed to it, and the fact I think it's the worst thing about it too. Some really? of his narrate, some of his dialogue with the other characters is like he's reading a phone book. <laughs> look, look, six cannons with gunners standing by, yeah. like just uh, no inflection. Like anyway, but go on. <laughs> I, just, I, I could listen to him read the phone book. Oh, oh yeah, it's wonderful, boy. wonderful yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah. But, there is yeah. a. The, well, on the I think the anniversary of that album, there was a, a massive set released with like six or oh, seven I have discs. It. I have it. Yes. Do you have the one with all the Richard Burton outtakes? I do. There's outtakes of him and him and Phil Leonard interacting. There's uh, alternate versions of some of the music. Mm. It's it's very good. I'm it's hard to, to find now, though. Very hard to find. 
I actually managed to get that. Uh, yeah. I was doing an in-store with the band that I was in, in, in Buffalo. Um, and the guy in my band knew the store managers. He goes, we weren't a famous band, but he got, we were doing an in-store and nobody came to get their album signed because we were nobodies. But anyway, I saw this, I saw this box set sitting up on the shelf. I said, well, how much do you want for that? He said, oh, well, you know, because you're in the band, I'll give it to you half price. <laughs> so I got this massive like dream box set for a fraction of the price. I'm very grateful Fantastic. for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's a thing to treasure on your shelf, isn't it? So I'm never getting rid of that. They can bury yeah. that on my on my chest in my mm. coffin. You can leave that. I've thought of one more thing I'm going to mention, and it's only just occurred to me. Years ago, my mate Yaki said, there's this H.G. Wells book called The Star Forgotten. Right. I have and a copy of it. Yeah, I've got a copy of it as well, and I still haven't read it. But it's it may be a sort of sequel to War of the Worlds. I did read that, and yet I haven't read the book for some reason. Well, there's some homework for us then. Isn't there? Yeah, it's got that. Actually, I think I sent you a, a picture of the cover. I mean, it's got the one with that weird, weird octopus we did. thing on it. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. did. We but should... It didn't occur to me that that might have been meant to be one of these Martians. Hmm. hmm. I think Let's we're going to have to. Ex- we've we'll got to investigate. Oh. Indeed. Yes. Right. Well, we've got our homework. With that, I'll say thank you so much once again for coming by Derry and Tom's to talk about the well, War of the Worlds. Much. And we are going to play the show out with your version of Forever Autumn. Well, that is wonderful. Thanks for doing that. And uh, we'll hopefully I'll, I'll be back to uh, slander some more literature. <laughs> Let's think of something. <laughs> All right. All right. Cheers. Bye bye. Massive thanks to Alistair for coming back to Derry and Tom's for a second go around. Alistair's novel, The Music of the Spheres, is available now, and you can find his music at thegatelessgate.bandcamp.com I'll link to both of those in the show notes. Since recording this, I foolishly decided to investigate a third sci-fi channel adaptation of The War of the Worlds. And it was terrible. Except for the scene where a war machine eats some bloke, and that was hilarious. And it was one of Tom Sizemore's final acting gigs, and he plainly knew he was in something bad. It also occurred to me that we didn't mention the Orson Welles radio play, so I'll just say here, it's great, but pretty front-loaded. The best part is the infamous fur radio broadcast from the Cylinder Landing site, and it's still pretty incredible to listen to today. Meanwhile, we've had some feedback over on YouTube regarding a couple of older episodes. On Crab's Moon, Carl Strawn said, Whenever I go to Anglesey, I know it's not Barmouth, but I keep expecting, brackets hoping, to bump into Ian and Julie on the beach. By the way, this is one of the funniest reviews of any book, or saying that any review of anything on YouTube I've had the pleasure to listen to. You need to spread your wings and get a bigger audience. Thanks for that, Carl. Audience size is nice, but ultimately, just getting feedback like this is reward enough, and I thank you for it, and I've passed it on to Graham and Phil too. And on our episode on the dark, Ecstatic said, Christopher Priest wrote two Doctor Who scripts. Obviously, they weren't made into stories. Thanks for the info, mate. I'll have to look those up now. And you'll have heard that Christopher Priest cropped up again on this show too. We might have to look at him more closely. Over on Podmean, Demeter commented, Enjoy your content. Plenty of flavour and ideas for my wargaming, The Rise of the Ruby Throne. Always happy to help. Thanks for letting us know, and do keep us posted on The Rise of the Ruby Throne too. It's time for thanks to our patrons. First, those without tear. Anthony Paconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster, and Sebastian Weetabix. And to our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Lee Gary, Malpertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Menion, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Scott Butler, Simon Perrins, and Tony Malazzo. And of course, thanks to our crafty jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Tom Murphy, Mark Hebden, Graham Holden, Jason Connolly, and Ray Otis. Ray must have got fed up brute of Lashmar's snoring and is headed over to the gaming tables at the Terminal Cafe. Much appreciated, Ray. And finally, eternal thanks to our patron demons, Andy Darby, Clarky the Crew, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Gwen Barlow, 
Imria, Jenny Stim, Jay Risa, Jay Monty, Liam Jay, Miles Reed Labato, Mark Main, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, David Lee, the OG patron, Norman Beresford, and last, but of course, never least, Robert McMillan. Right enough yakking, stay tuned after the Oola for Forever Autumn from Alice's album, Barren Land. But in the meantime, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins@outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. BITR Breakfast in the Ruins Radio is live again on Radio Garden or via the web player at breakfastintheruinsradio.blogspot.com. We have our Patreon page too. There are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Roads. If to hide the lonely 
情。